The proceeding will start shortly. 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 Order, order. This is the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, and this is our hearing into the economics of music streaming. Today we've got two panels, and our first panel is uh, Peter Leatham, Chief Executive of the Phonographic Performance Limited, and Andrea Martin, Chief Executive of PRS for Music. Good morning, Peter, and good morning, Andrea. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Now, before we start our first question, I'm going to uh, open up for members' interests. So, Kevin Brennan. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to refer, obviously, to my uh, entry and register of members' interests. Um, I'm a member of PRS for Music, and I've received tickets and hospitality from PRS for Music and some royalties in the past. I've received tickets and hospitality from Universal Music Group, who are in front of us later. I'm a member of the Musicians' Union, and they made a donation to my electoral fund, and I've had some earnings as a musician declared. Thank you. Steve Bryan. Yes, very similar to Mr. Brennan. Uh, I have received hospitality from Universal Music and PRS for Music in the past. Thank you. Does anyone else have any interest to declare? No. OK, so our first questions come from Kevin Brennan. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Chair, and welcome, uh, uh, Andrea and Peter. Peter, could I um, ask you a few questions to kick things off? And we are pushed for time, so I'm going to sort of rattle through these as quickly as we can uh, this morning. Uh, PPL has, has traditionally collected um, revenue derived from linear radio play, amongst other things. Um, as the way people consume music is changing, including by streaming, how is that affecting the sort of income that PPL is able to collect? I think that PPL has had a very successful 10 years in terms of our growth. I think we've, uh, up in 2019, the last year we announced all our financial results for, we collected £271 million, which is almost a doubling of that over the last 10 years, so £128 million increase. So we've seen 10 years of consistent growth. Um, and uh, even though we've had, obviously, the rise of streaming other other activities, um, things like commercial radio continue to grow. So our, our revenue from radio over the last five years has grown by just over 20%. Um, radio, commercial radio listening is at the highest. It's, it's been 35 million listeners a week. Um, and so, so certain things at the moment are continuing to grow for performers and record companies. You, would you, um, given the growth in streaming, which has been huge in, in recent years, would you favour something like equitable remuneration, which is um, paid in relation to radio play and so on, being extended to streaming? Well, I think from, from BPL's point of view, we're given a certain amount of rights by record companies and performers. So we're obviously licensing public performance, uh, TV, radio, we go around the world collecting as well. So part of our role is actually to take those rights that are, that are given to us and try to administer them as carefully and as uh, accurately as possible and take those forward. Now, from our, from our point of view, we don't particularly have a view about other income streams as to whether or not they should be having certain uh, rights, etc. If there were those rights, then obviously PPL could pl play a role and perform there. But, but um, as I say, we don't have a particular opinion about which other services should have um, streaming rights from. Um, but but you'd be happy to administer them if that were if a change happened that that meant that money came your way from streaming. Yeah, I mean we're we're a, we're a professional sort of repertoire uh, matching and distribution uh, uh, service. We receive over thirty thousand recordings a week. Um, we paid last year one hundred uh, 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 sorry, sorry, paid many uh, record companies and performers. One hundred uh, so so over one hundred thousand performers were paid uh, last year. Uh, about twelve thousand recording rights holders. So we're set up to handle large amounts of repertoire, to make large payments. And so, yeah, if the new rights came along, we could play a role in administering those. OK. Now, um, th there are some new sort of um, services on online. Do you get m money from um, um, an organized uh, a service like Apple Beats, which seems to be like a, a linear, almost like a radio station? Do, do they actually uh, pay money to PPL? Yeah, so what's happened is that um, our streaming tradition, as you say, was radio and TV. Uh, gradually, that's moved into other areas, such as, um, for example, the BBC will have its iPlayer, catch-up TV, catch-up radio. 
So we've, we've done licensing in that particular area. And, um, and then also we license about three and a half uh, thousand internet radio stations. So there's been this gradual movement of, uh, of where that licensing takes place. Um, something like Apple is a good example where Apple is actually licensed directly by the record companies, but they have now launched um, Apple Music Radio. Uh, and that's an area where that does have remuneration to be paid. So there's currently a dialogue going on at the moment about PPL finding, providing some administration there to make sure the performers are paid that ER for that particular service. So you'd expect them to be paying in the near future. And would you expect any backdating of that? Uh, yes, on both counts. OK, um, PPL's Momentum Fund, do you want to tell the committee um, what that is? Because uh, it's been a, a source of support, I think, that, you know, for musicians during the current situation and how that gets funded. Yeah, so, so PPL, within about 12 months of the uh, end of a particular year, we pay out about 96% of our money. As I say, we paid uh, um, sort of about 12,000 record company rights holders and about 122,000 performers last year. So there's, there's lots of money going out there. And then we spend about six years trying to find performers to make sure they're linked to recordings to make them paid. So by the end of that six year period, we have a situation where we have to close down that distribution and we have around about one and a half to two percent of the money left. Um, and then what we do historically, we've actually um, then distributed that pro rata to those performers and record companies in that particular distribution that were paid. More recently, what we've started to do, and this is led by the performers and the record companies, have been looking at how can we support new talent? How can we support artist welfare and a range of different funding things? So what we've done over the last few years is we've come together with the PRS Foundation, who um, have been running for a number of years, and we've started to provide some additional funding, as well as the funding provided by PRS, to things like the Momentum Fund, which is trying to identify up and coming artists to provide them funding to take their career to the next stage. And so what we're doing there is that rather than um, redistributing pro rata some of those monies uh, at the end of six years um, to other members, um, there's been a decision made, actually, that's probably a good time to be trying to help support the next layer of talent to come through in a very difficult industry. So the, 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 the artists who, are, who might otherwise get some of that pro rata distribution effectively are uh, giving off some income to help new up and coming artists. Do the record labels contribute their share to that fund? Um, in, in relation to the Momentum Fund, no, that is actually funded by the performer side. Um, and again, it's decisions made by the different interest groups, the record companies and performers as to how they're going to use that money and which bits they're going to support. So on that particular PPL Momentum Fund, that is supported by the performer side. So the record labels just keep their share of it? Yeah, on the, on the record company side, what they do is that is just redistributed pro rata across those uh, record companies. And they take the view that they'll then take that and then reinvest it in their own artists and repertoire, their own artists, and develop from there. Okay. Um, could I also um, just ask um, Andrea one question because we're on a very tight timetable today? So I'm just going to ask you the one question. With, when you got, do you get money from services like Facebook and um, for for PRS, which which you know obviously is is responsible for paying out songwriters and composers um, for their uh, copyright? Do they, do they give you the data of, of, of the music that they're playing? And are you able to identify whose music's been played on Facebook? So, Mr. Bren, I wonder if it would be worth it just quickly, I know we're under time, just to under, make sure that people understand what PRS for music does. I think, I think probably if you just answer this question, Andrew, because, because okay. of time constraints, so we can, we, we've got quite extensive briefing in front of us, so that, that can all be on the record in our written evidence. Yeah. Okay, so um, as you know, I'm relatively new in, in, in this business. My background is data transformation, digital and tech. Got over 30 years experience um, and on data and PRS, and like many companies, handle big data. Um, and so one of the the things I've learned over the 30 years is better data in, better data out. Um, and yes, we do get data from uh, Facebook. And uh, in 2019, PRS for Music processed almost 19 trillion usage of music. And we think this year it's about 25 to 30 trillion. It's a huge, really a huge amount of data, Andrew. Do, do, but do Facebook actually tell you then which music is being played or they just give you a, a chunk of money for you to distribute pro rata? So it, it depends on, um, you know, the accuracy of the data and how quickly we get it. Yes, they do. 
Um, and in some cases, uh, because of the hosting defense and safe harbor, we don't always get, um, and because of content recognition, we don't always get all the data and all the content. Okay. Um, and okay. I think the government can really help us on, uh, on that, on articles uh, 16 of the copyright um, directive, uh, not the copyright directive, but the collective, um, definitely on article 16, the, the government can help us make sure that we do get data and in a certain standard. Thank right, you. Um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to leave it there, Chair, uh, given the time constraints. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Wheeler? Um, Andrea, you brought me nicely to my question, which was, what could the government do to help you about data? So could you expand a little bit more about this Article 16 so that uh, everybody that's watching could learn a bit more? Absolutely, Mr. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Wheeler. The Article 16 is the Collective Rights Management Regulation, which stipulates to make sure that to enforce the provision of data so the user that they provide the data under certain standards. And I think it's really important because in the last five years of the regulation, it hasn't been really implemented and we haven't seen the government using those tools. And it's really important because the more data we get, the more accurate and quickly, the more we can pay our members of what's due to them. So what you're saying is there's an existing regulation which would help actually transfer from the data that you get money to your members. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the government doesn't um, insist on Article 16 being used or? No, exactly. We, we actually haven't seen the government really using those tools that are available. Andrew, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. I'll finish there, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, that was so quick you caught me out there. Uh, Steve Bryan. <laughs> Speed is of the essence. Um, Andrea, uh, good, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, just, just reading over the last couple of days your submission to us. Um, I'm interested in just exploring a little bit on the, on the so-called safe harbour provisions, if I may. Um, you call on the, on the government to to get with its commitment to close what, what, what's known as the value gap by addressing the safe harbour provisions for, for social media. Obviously, the, the difference between music uploaded to social media and uploaded streaming services. So, so, so can I just explore with you, how, how does licensing music for social media companies, so YouTube, com for instance, compare to other streaming services? Could you just explore that for us, for our evidence? Yes, so what's really important what I want is to make sure that whenever and wherever music, you know, members are used online, they're paid for it, okay? And they have to be licensed. And so to make sure that there's fair value, you know, when we look at the hosting defense in the EU or the safe harbor in the US, it dates back to 2001. If you think of it, the iPod didn't even exist then. You know, and that's almost 20 years. Yes, there has been an evolution, but the market is going really quickly and it has to be modernized. Um, yes, the EU has recognized that and issued um, a directive, Article 17 of the Copyright Directive, uh, that limits the scope of safe harbor or the scope of hosting defense in the, in, in the EU. And I think that the UK government, and I heard also on previous um, sessions, the UK government has a huge opportunity now to take what the EU has done and improve it so much better to make sure that the money that is due to our members, that more money goes back into the pockets of the creators. I think it's really important that we update that legislation and we really uh, you know, the, the hosting defense allows some online performers um, platforms to claim uh, that they aren't liable um, for the music and, and, and uh, you know, uh, don't pay out to our members. 
but presumably this is not just a role for the UK government. I mean, I, I hear you that, that obviously we are we sit outside the EU's uh, regulatory regime now, um, but what they do matters to what we do. And, and this is more of a, this is a global issue, isn't it? So I, I wonder what work PRS does with its uh, brother and sister companies around the world in this respect. Um, so definitely we work with our sister companies through CSAC, which is an international body. And we do what we can to make sure that um, they also implement global um, legislation. Um, and really, we have done a lot of work on this PRS, and we're more than happy to share with the committee all the work we have done on that. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Damien Green? You're muted, Damien. Damien Green, you're still muted. There you, you go. I know uh, we've all got used to this, so apologies. Uh, morning, uh, both of you. Um, Andrea, um, your submission uh, says that the music market is uh, characterised by a lack of meaningful competition, which is chilling growth and innovation. That's that's quite a strong statement. Would you like to expand on it? What uh, you know, what, what form does this take? What effect does it have? Well, I think there's, it's twofold. It goes back to um, Article 17, um, but it also goes, if you Google or you go on to a browser and you Google free music, there's so many platforms that offer free musics that are not licensed. So there's this concept that you know, music is free, and it's that there will be few, you know free music available, and that people don't have to pay for it. And you know, these are issues that needs to be fixed for the online market to make sure that we get as much money for the creators as possible. That's one thing. That's the, the sort of attitude of mind um, that music is free, but <clears throat> it's specifically the point about competition. Um, that seems to me may well lie at, at the root of this. If you had a competitive market, then the money would flow through. There would be competition, would force you know, money through to artists, songwriters, and so on, uh, you know, whose who's, you know, concerns obviously we, we share. Um, I mean, is it the fact that you've got a, a small number of big players who have you know, many stakes in streaming services and so on, and it, it feels on the surface like a sort of classic definition of an oligopoly. Is, is that what you're getting at? Do you think it's that bad? Well, I, are you referring to... Um, are you the, referring the, the, the to... The big music companies. I mean, you know, the, the, the people who are coming up next. To the record labels on that? Just yeah. want to clarify. Right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I think one of the things, and that's why I would have um, loved to, to, to do an introduction, um, you know, at PRS, we take care of the performing rights of the songs. We don't overlook, like Peter, um, you know, PPL overlooks at the performing and the sound recording of the songs. Um, so to, to really, this is not an issue for PRS. We focus on making sure that the copyright framework is what we have and what we make sure that are the rights that we take care of, which is the performing rights, um, is taken care of for our members. Okay, well, maybe I should put that question to, to Peter instead. Do you worry that you're, you're trying to deal with, a, with effectively an oligopoly? I think, I, think there's, uh, I think there's plenty of competition in the market. I think one of the big problems you have is that the market peaked back in uh, 2001 for recorded music. Um, we then had Napster come along and all the years of piracy. So the, the overall music industry suffered quite a lot of decline until 2014. Now, since then, fortunately, got a better handle on piracy. I mean, at the same time as we had a sort of LimeWire, Kazaa had to be shut down, the Pirate Bay, all these different things had to be shut down. And then we've got a number of viable, uh, very popular streaming services that come along. So from 2014, the market has grown up until you know, the most recent declared numbers in 2019. But the market back in 20, uh, 2001 was uh, 23 billion US dollars. 
And uh, as of 2019, it was back to 20 US billion dollars. But that's that means that on a, on a like for like basis of some real money terms, um, that 2001 23 billion dollars is worth 33 billion. So you can see even now we're only back to two thirds of the value of the market. And so what you have is you've got um, lots and lots of activity, lots of streaming taking place. The value of the market is that much less. And with so much more streaming and so much more back catalog, so much more competition, you've got a smaller pie that everybody is fighting over. And this is why the music industry has come back at times to try and say, look, we do need support, as Andrew is saying there, in terms of the value gap and things that are happening, because yes, actually, it's really good. The music industry has been growing for the last few years and lots of positivity, really good demand for music. Um, but there is an, an actually licensing of the likes of um, Spotify, Apple Music, Deezer, Amazon, et cetera, has all gone, has been going in a good direction. But their prices have been stuck um, at the sort of 10 pounds since the noughties. Um, you've then got some limitations there. And then also on the value gap, we're just identifying as the tricordist explained, when you look at the 2019 US market, 51% of the streams from YouTube were 7% of the value. And that's why the whole discussion in Europe came through in terms of the value gap. That's why moving forward, we would like support that even though we're not now going to implement that uh, copyright directive from Europe, we would like to have support from government to say the clearly is an issue there still. There does need to be more liability at the ISP level to make sure that a more better deals can be done that then support the overall industry. And it's not just supporting just record companies, it's the, it's the thousands of performers that are then struggling to make a living given the competition, given the lower value of the overall marketplace. And that's why, as I say, support on piracy, stopping piracy, support on the value gap are the sorts of things where we can get the industry back to a level where we actually exceed where we were back in 2001. I, I, I get, I mean, the, the, the point about eliminating piracy and, and, and the value gap, I'm sure that there'd be not much con controversy about that. But I just want to tease out, of, of, do you identify two separate problems? One, that for all the reasons you've just said, the market is still in real terms smaller than it was in 20 years ago. That, that's, that's one problem. But is there a separate problem that, if you like, too much of the money that does flow into this market uh, sticks at the sides before it gets to the performers and, and, the, and the songwriters. Do you, do you identify that as a separate problem or do you think that that problem is being overstated by previous witnesses we've had at this committee? Well, I think I don't, I don't, have, the direct, I don't have the direct evidence of exactly what's happening on individual uh, deals and the payments through, et cetera. But what you do see is that it, actually, if anything, I would say you've got a more competitive market now than you used to have, say, 10, 20 years ago, because if you're a performer now, you can, uh, go to a record company, you can go to a record with all different shapes and sizes, or you can do it yourself. You can actually go and do your own releasing. You can go, if, if you know, compared to when you had a more physical market and you had to probably go through some of the record companies to get your shelf space and in the record store or the supermarket. So there is plenty of competition there, and there is a very broad market there, which you've got legal advisors, accountancy managers to try and advise you on the right um, route to take. Um, so overall, I think there is in the, in the marketplace and the flexibility to do what you want to do in the digital space, the, 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 options, the options are there. What you're faced with is that, as I say, you, you're faced with an overall market, which is uh, less than two thirds of what it was 20 years ago. And then you're also faced with massive competition because you've got, if you look at in 2019, two of the best selling albums were, you know, Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody based on the film and Abbey Road by the Beatles, it's 50 year anniversary. So you've got this massive, but so as well as trying to break a new artist and try and get your own streaming going, you've got the sort of the last 50 years of the music industry you've got to compete with in terms of trying to get yourself, your streaming, your activity. So generally speaking, it's hard, but ultimately you have got a lot of people, you've got some of the most talented people in our, in our society as performers, et cetera, are struggling to make a living because the overall economics of trying to make it all add up for the size of the market and how things operate is hard. In a sense, that's even more bleak than the, the, the message we've had from from the performers. They all said, if you you, you know you can change the rules a bit uh, and and you know, discuss all the details we've been discussing, uh, and they could then uh, have a chance of making a living. And what you're saying is, you know, it's just tough. It's going to be a really tough industry to to break into. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, not trying to be, I'm not trying to be bleak. I'm not trying to say it's in a way. Actually, I think that when you look at the years of growth that we've had, 2014 to 2020, music is as popular as ever. It's incredibly important to people's identity, to the culture, young culture, et cetera. So music is brilliant. It's, it's, it's like, it's not as if it's like Kodak film that just completely, there was no demand for it anymore and had to shut down. 
music is very, very popular, which is good. Um, and the demand and the increase is there, which is good. And the service is developing, which is all good. What I just want to identify is that we shouldn't forget, though, that the current size of the industry and the current you know, demands and competition makes it quite hard. But with the right level of support and the way that things are going, then you can continue to, you know, if the, if the market, if the value was back as it was back in 2001, there is absolutely no reason why you can't generate that value again. But as I say, um, record companies and performers need a bit of support along the way to make sure you've got the right level of copyright protection to uh, make sure you can shut down sites like Pirate Bay, or you can actually then have a value gap and make sure that some of the value of music that's been distributed around is make sure it finds its way back to performers who are basically and songwriters that are the original creators of, uh, of, of the music. So I'm not trying to be bleak. I, might, I think there's very good, I think for me, I think there's brilliant prospects for music going forward. And I think if you look at the UK coming out and having gone to forge its own way in the world now, if you look at um, the UK, one in every 10 streams last year was from a UK artist. So you've got a math, you've got a massive export potential. You've got, you know, where it's a, we're very, very good at music in the UK. Absolutely, we should be going. What are some of the things that are going to help us go out and uh, negotiate new trade deals and and take Britain forward in this new world? And you would look at music as being something that's respected around the world. It's massively in demand, um, and we should be trying to support it to to carry on doing that. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, Andrea, do you want to come back? Yeah, just to support what uh, Peter is saying, I think there's really three things that we need to see. We have to make sure that everybody who has on their servers are provide to our consumers that the music is licensed. That absolutely needs to happen. And these unlicensed platforms that I talk about, you know, have to be stopped because then there's the concept with consumers that music is free. And that does not help, okay? And then I think there's the piracy, you know, the, 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 the all around the stream ripping, which is a service that allows users to have unaltered copy of music that is, and doesn't have to pay to the creators does not help. So, you know, it's, it, there's a couple of things that could be implemented to protect the value and making sure that our members, the songwriters, composers and publishers are paid. And like I said, I talked about data too, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to you, Julian. Thank you, Damien. Uh, just following up, uh, just into Peter, uh, into your answer to Damien. First of all, would you be able to share the analysis you just cited about market size, especially in terms of spend per head on music? on a like-to-like -like basis opposed to global total revenue with the committee at a later date. Is that okay? Yeah, we can put some data together for you. I'm very happy to do that. No, thank you. Thank you. Right, right, thank you. Um, just summing up what your answer was to Damien there to a certain extent, is it, is it fair to say that the financial pressures that the industry has faced, uh, the, the major decline that happened uh, in, the, in the, the decade before this, and the fact that effectively streaming has come along and uh, as well as a, a greater uh, ability to stop piracy has, has, has effectively helped the industry recover, but not recover enough. And therefore the industry is falling back on slightly archaic means by which to ensure that their bottom line isn't affected. I'm thinking things like breakages. I'm thinking things, for example, such as the very, very sort of um, uh, opaque contracts that are, seem to be abound within the industry itself. Is it fair to say that the, the assets have been sweated over the last few years, and those assets are the, the artists themselves? Uh, well, I think for, I think for myself, I've, I've got not got direct knowledge of actually what's going on in terms of what's in what artists are signing to, etc. But I think that, um, as I said, as I said before, I think we you've, there is actually a very competitive market that takes place, and there is good access in the uh, in the UK to artists. Uh, lawyers like Tom Fredericks who came and advised you or uh, uh, to um, Colin Young as an accountant and, and managers etc so th there will be a certain amount of advice for performers to try and sign up on on sensible terms to to to, to go forward with record companies and to try and protect themselves um, but I think that you know in a way you're going to get a 
um, you know, stronger answers from either the performer or from those from the record company side themselves as to what they're doing in terms of those deals. But as I say, I think there is there is good advice around. There are choices you can make as a performer. Do you go to the record company, whether you do it yourself, or which record company you choose. Um, and so there's that competitive market to uh, to take place. But uh, you know, as I say, I, I, I wouldn't have the direct evidence or I could give you on in terms of those artist deals. Well, I mean, one of the ones that has been cited from the committee you, you, you see in the evidence is the fact that breakages are charged in the digital age. We have breakages. Sure, that's just a means by which to the the the, the, the record companies effectively are, are boosting their profits uh, because they can see a slightly declining cake, so to speak, which is what you mentioned earlier on. I mean, it, it, it does seem to be quite staggering that the, the artists could be charged breakages. I, I would agree with you. On the, on the face of it, I would agree with you. That just sounds like a, something that doesn't sound very sensible. But, you know, when I... But it doesn't sound around, sensible. It, sound, it's deep, it sounds deeply unfair. Yeah, I know. But, but, but equally, I said that's where you've got to look into the, the overall deal-making mechanics that are going on, because quite often the artist lawyers are asking for those to be retained as they're trying to think about how they do their over, overall deal negotiations. So all I'm saying is there that I agree on the face of it, it doesn't sound like the thing you should be having. But in terms of the attempts to reform recording contracts over, over time, I just know from anecdotal evidence that there, is, there are different pressures as to what the overall deal is and how you actually how you, extra, how you make the deal work. So that would be something, again, others would have to give uh, direct evidence on. OK. Uh, Andrea, YouTube has told us that over half of all revenues uh, generated by the music industry come from copyright claims made through Content ID and other tools. Do you agree with that assertion? And is YouTube doing your job? The job of rights holders that that's a really great point so yes you know the market has you know content tools and and they're growing and increasingly competitive but again i go back to the the, the point of better data in and it's in this case it's not just better data in it's all data in and better data out you know and the content recognition it depends on how it's deployed how it's applied you know, and um, you know, we as right holders for our members, we need to be confident that the content recognition tools are being applied on all content uploaded on the services. You know, okay. and, and, and we know that our members' works are being identified, are not always identified by these recognition tools. Why is that? Might want to ask. Um, the content ID. What do you think it is though? What is your suspicion? Well, I think it goes back also to um, the hosting defense and the safe harbor. Mm. That needs to be updated. Right, okay. Do you think that the tech used by YouTube um, to enforce copyright is effective therefore? I think it's effective to a certain point but it has to be used on all content and it has to, we have to make sure that all that content is licensed okay. before it's put on the service. Right, and when you say all content, do you mean effectively across the whole board? So uh, visual and also- Well, I'm talking well. about our reg holders, which is, you know, the, the songwriters and composers of the song. Right, okay, thank you. Charles Watling? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, 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 something occurred to me, it, I, I'm interested in the conversations you're having with the big three. I mean, listening to some of the artists that have been before this committee, um, I, I get the impression that sometimes they feel like they're shouting into a void and not being heard. Um, I mean, clearly, it's, interest, it's in the interest of all the majors, the big three, to make sure that the artists are properly remunerated. And, and that clearly spurs creativity and, and makes their businesses sustainable in the long run. Now, are they, are the big three, are they, the big uh, music publishers in danger of killing the golden goose? Um, what dialogue are you having, Andrea? Well, we, we don't have dialogue with the record labels. We have dialogue with the publishers of the big three. Um, you know, that, and that's the dialogue that we have, not with the artist or the uh, recording label. But well, why not? I, I would have thought that would because that's better. not what you know. I think uh, I think what's important. And I would have loved to to talk about what PRS is, but we represent the performing rights of the song. 
I, I, I get that. I think there might be a dialogue. The writers and the publishers that publish the songs. Okay, okay, I, I take that. Thank you. Um, so, 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 Peter, um, if uh, music is licensed by you for TV or film, and then sub to uh, social media, who is responsible under current arrangements for notifying YouTube and ensuring that enforcement takes place and that the artists are properly remunerated? Yeah, at the moment, so we will we will license um, a range of uh, secondary sales, as you identify. So there's always been a vibrant market for, you know, we create very good programmes and uh, uh, over in the UK. So whether it's uh, something like uh, the BBC's Top Gear, which is a massive set around the world. So we've long licensed that sort of secondary sales uh, uh, to different TV, et cetera. And also now on to some of the uh, streaming uh, areas. Now, we, we will license that transfer and the value that when they've got music within that and they'll report to us, et cetera. But that's us licensing the likes of the BBC or ITV for those. We're not licensing uh, YouTube at all. That's something that's done directly by the record company. So that other part of policing how things work with YouTube or any of the streaming platforms is, is directly done by the record companies and they'll account through to their artists as appropriate under their deals, et cetera. So, so PPL's bit is very much about licensing the original TV production, uh, the original sort of playing of those, um, of those films or TV, et cetera, uh, and any subsequent sale of that onto other platforms. But as I say, then the licensing of those other platforms is handled by the record companies directly. Okay, thank you, that's very clear. Um, uh, so going back to you, Andrea, uh, briefly, do you think that we talked about earlier about uh, piracy, uh, uh, stream ripping, um, illegitimate music streaming apps, etc. What more legislation can you quantify? I want to drill down a little further. What more legislation well, do you think? It I really think, no, specific legislation we would have to absolutely sit down and we did do already. PRS has done independent uh, research into this problem of strip, you know, stream uh, ripping in being the first in the association with the UK government, and we would be more than happy to share with the committee. But we have to make sure that this free unlicensed platforms shouldn't be allowed. Right. You know? you and that, and yeah. the user and the consumer, you, you know, do it your, you know, yourself. Be Google free music, and there's so much, and there are many of them are unlicensed platforms. So more robust legislation, it's not a question for just in enforcement of existing legislation, you want more robust legislation. Absolutely, especially on, on streaming and, and these unlicensed platforms, it's going to be really important. Because then also the consumer is used to having free music, you know, and, and, and this free music, they, yeah. they, they don't pay the right holders. Yeah, I, we've got that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Giles. And that concludes our first panel. Uh, thank you to Peter Leatham, Chief Executive of the Phonographic Performance Limited, and Andrea Martin, Chief Executive PRS, for music, for your evidence today. We're going to take a short recess while we set up our second panel. Order, order. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceeding is currently suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. Order, order. This is Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, <coughs> and this is our second <coughs> panel, which is into in uh, into economics and music streaming. Uh, could I ask, please, that if if you're not um, answering questions, if you could mute, if that's okay. Thank you. Our second panel consists of Tony Harlow, Chief Executive Warner Music UK, Jason Lilly, Chairman and Chief Executive Sony Music UK and Ireland, Daisy David Joseph, Chairman and Chief Executive Universal Music UK and Ireland. Tony, Jason and David, thank you very much for joining us today. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, our first question is going to come from Clive Efford. Clive? Thank you, Chair, um, and, and welcome. Uh, in, our, in our last panel, we discussed how publishers license collectively through PRS for music. Why is there no collective licensing for recordings? Any one of you can... Who would like to answer that one? Do you, do you, want, to, do you want to go first, uh, Tony? Sure, um, Mr Chairman. Um, thank you. And uh, let me just talk to the question for a second. I think it's uh, what we, what we uh, use in music is the direct licence, um, and we use that for primary rights, and uh, we pay for the collective licence for auxiliary or secondary rights. Uh, and that operates really well, and the two collecting societies you've been talking to this morning uh, are principally in, in secondary or ancillary rights. And would anyone else like to answer that? So I'm I'm I'm, um, I'm happy to. Um, the it, we have a direct relationship between our artists in terms of our teams and our investment and our relationship with artists, and then. <laughs> Also, the platform. So, it, um, but in broadcast, that goes through something like PPL, but not in terms of the um, direct relationship we we have. Um, and uh, but my question is, why is that? And I'm, I'm not asking you to describe what what actually happens. I'm saying, why is there no collective license in in recording? So, Clive, to just pick that up again. Um, I think the answer to that is we believe that that direct relationship that Mr. Joseph just referred to gives the maximum power of negotiation and uh, it is underpinned by the ability ultimately to say no 
uh, to any license, and that is the maximum strength to get the best position. And wherever that position is weakened, for example, by the safe harbor, that was very much the theme of the conversation before, we get less good and less effective deals. And I think that's why we favor the direct negotiation. Well, can I, can I ask you about licensing social media companies like YouTube and, and, and Twitch? I mean, how do you go about doing that? Well, how are they licensed? Any one of you can answer. Uh, do you want to go, go with that, Jason? Um, we, we have a relationship with all of our streaming services, and we try to do the best, as Mr. Harlow just explained, we try to do the very best in our negotiation with those services. And our view is that we have the ability to walk away from the table if we need to. So that's why we prefer to negotiate our rights with the respective streaming services, because Whereas with, with the PPL or that conversation, there isn't essentially the ability for them to walk away from the conversation. Our, we have walked away from the conversation. Our interests are to protect our artists and to get the best deals for our artists. So that's why we believe that we should be in control of those, those, those conversations. Uh, I, I, we've seen evidence that uh, uh, YouTube uh, has, uh, has said that it's likely to be the number one source of revenue for the industry by 2025. Is that is that a healthy state for the industry to be in? Is that and, and is it in the interests of the artists? Any one of you could answer. Yes, sorry, it's a bit difficult to work out who's going to step in, Mr. F. <laughs> what I, what I what we would say about it is last one to step backwards. It sounds like to me, but. Uh... <laughs> Um, not at all. I think um, what we would say is YouTube is the source uh, for more people than all the other streaming platforms put together. And as such, it's the way people, a lot of people like to consume <coughs> music. Uh, and it's a way a lot of our artists like to share music. What we would say is it would be healthier if YouTube was not, in a, uh, not able to use uh, YouTube and other platforms like that. And you listed a couple yourself, uh, were not as able to use safe harbor provisions. Uh, to, to where they can say that UGC content um, is not subject to, to uh, uh, is protected on their services. And I think um, what you'd look at is what we would always argue for is the maximum possible pool to, to share with. And what we've seen over the streaming era is the pool of revenue and the pool of income going back to artists growing so that we're paying more royalties now than we were before uh, in 2015, it's raised from 27 to 32 percent. If you're talking Warner, and if the pool grew on the basis of less ability to hide behind safe harbour, that was probably the most effective thing we could ask for to improve the artist position. Okay, well, let me just move, move on to Spotify. Uh, Mr. Joseph, in 2017, Universal negotiated a new multi year global license agreement with Spotify. Were you allowed Spotify to reduce royalty rates if it met certain revenue targets? So has Spotify met those targets uh, and have the reduction in rates been passed on to artists? Mr. Joseph? Um, sorry, in terms of um, in terms of any, because this is, I, I should say this is an incredibly competitive um, environment and I mean so competitive um, there are so many more choices and so many more labels for people I mean the uh, I noticed this when we were trying to open questions before I, I should explain that um, I haven't seen Tony Harlow for about 10 years so Tony hi or I've probably spoken to Jason for a few years so we are incredibly competitive companies so I think you'll understand why. But I between you, you have 60 to 70% of the market. So, so, so I can only speak on behalf of Universal Music, but I can't obviously details of our deal for our music and our artists with Spotify is something I can't discuss private publicly on this call. I'm very happy. Well, okay, but but I'm not asking you to give me details of the deal. I'm, I'm asking you. Uh, you, you you came to this agreement with Spotify that the, they could reduce the royalty rates 
Um, but th I mean, did that result in a reduction in rates being passed on to the artists? That's the question. It's a yes or no, isn't it? Uh, um... No, I have to take a step back because th these are global deals. Um, th there are many, many of these deals because we're embracing as many music services as possible. You're talking about one, there are about 250, 300 agreements we have in place with different music services <laughs> around the world. And, and they cover every corner of the globe. They're all different types of services as we've learned so far on the inquiry. Yeah, and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to cut across you because we are short of time, but but the question is, uh, did it result in a reduction in rates being passed on to the artists? I mean, that, that's a straightforward question. I'm not asking you to divulge details of the uh, of the deal. Well, then I'll say that there is no scenario where we are successful and our artists are not successful. No, that's not, excuse because, me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, I really do have to cut across his chair. I, I'm, I'm really sorry. Mr. Evans asked you this question three times now. Well, we could be here, frankly, I've got all day, so we could st sit here all day. It's, it's, it's a fairly straightforward question. Could you please answer the question? We, I'm happy to share any information about our deal with Spotify after this, after this session today. Um, but for competitive reasons, Mr. Chair, it is understand I, I, I'm really sorry, I'm sorry that, doesn't, that, that, that doesn't it, make sense it doesn't make sense at all I'm really sorry so, sorry excuse me can't Clive um, look the, the question is very simple it's a reduction it's just it is a reduction it is not the precise figures you're in front of a parliamentary select committee now now we've had uh, you know frankly in the past with uh, the likes of Google Facebook and YouTube but we've had them in front of us in Twitter and we found them to be frankly uh, dissembling and, and, and not being in any way clarity. So far, I have to say, you're beating them to the prize in terms of lack of clarity and lack of actual openness to a parliamentary committee. So, I'm going to, so Mr. Mr. Efford's going to put his question to you once more, and I do expect an answer. Mr. Efford. OK, so, so uh, the question is, has Spotify met the revenue targets, you, you agreed with them, and has any reduction in rates been passed on to artists? Um, your referring to probably a new deal that we negotiated in 2017 uh there's been subsequent deals since then with uh, spotify well you but you, you you negotiated a new new multi-year global license agreement with spotify in 2017 where you agreed with them to reduce royalty rates if they met certain targets so did they meet those targets and did that result in a reduction in rates being passed on to the artists, that's the we, straightforward we question. Have, we have increased our, well, because of streaming and digital, we've increased the amount that our artists get. Right, so no artist has, uh, has, has suffered a reduction in rates as a consequence of that deal. We've, that's increased, the we, we, we've increased the amount we pay to artists, but it is important and I hope we get a chance and, and, and Chair, I, I really am, uh, an open person. I've been watching all these inquiries. This is a business that is so close to my heart and soul. But please, and, and, and so much has been done about this. What, what, what is a stream? How do our artists get paid? I, re I really, really hope we can come on to that rather than focus on one uh, okay. company. Well, so, uh, so, 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 Mr. Jessup, you don't get to choose the questions. I'm, I'm not. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, okay, well, why don't we just, well, we, we, we clearly not getting away with this particular so, so, thing for so, the moment. I, I do, well, what we will do, let, let so, me move so, on. Order, order. What we will do is we will put this in, in writing and we will request that you put this in writing to us and you do it in a prompt fashion and you're clear, even if the information is to be held privately, we want to get full disclosure from you on this. Is that okay, Mr. Joseph? Absolutely. Fine. Okay. Thank Clive, you. sorry. So, so I, ju I just wanted to add, it, it was similar in terms negotiated with other streaming services. <clears throat> Mr. Joseph, were, were, have you negotiated similar deals with uh, other streaming services? You mentioned that you have several. We've, we've, we've negotiated very different, because all the services, different deals with about... 250 and 300 services the 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 primary purpose of that is to get our artists music available all throughout the world this incredible music and 
we're the biggest investor to to our artists and we want to pay them as much to as possible we have systems mr effort where all of our artists can see exactly what they're earning from streaming <clears throat> and other sorts of revenue on their phone or on their browser all of our managers look at how much they're earning so there's no opaqueness people can understand but please and i hope you understand in terms of that 250 300 global deals a i don't have all the information to hand on all of those but mr chair i will provide you as you uh, as you request that would be really helpful but your press release um at the time said that the unprecedented access to data creating the foundation for new tools for artists and labels to expand engage and build deeper connections with their fans what data did you receive from spotify and how exactly is it being used um so if i may uh for a second focus on two resources we have for artist managers and um well, i'd like you to both focus on the data specifically I, I, i'm just about i'm done. just i'm sorry i'm just i'm i'm literally just about to um, okay so there's two um portals one's called we have i can't speak on behalf of others in the industry it's called universal music artists it's a data portal where managers can look up all the trends behind the streaming data for their artists and that's by song, by platform, by country and audience. And it's incredible for tracking where an artist is growing their fan base, as well as how our marketing is working. Um, I'm very, very happy um, for another time to, to show you, everyone on the committee, these incredible portals. The data is about 24 hours kind of lag. I even checked in on a couple of our artists earlier to see how they were doing in, in different regions. All of this data can be broken down. I mean, it's literally something I have on my, on my phone and you can literally look at a, an artist, you can look at their fan base, you can look at what age of person is listening to their stream, where they are, how many times they listen, what songs they listen to, what albums they listen to, I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, I mean, there was one I saw, we've got a brand new artist and I saw that a huge proportion of their streams was coming from North America and Brazil. And, and I should explain, this then goes, and something I'd also love to show you, to the Global Royalty Portal. And there an artist can see a detailed financial summary. They can see their exact royalty earnings from streaming, from different formats, and they can see it by track, platform, territory, personal advances, recording costs. I launched these at one of our managers' meetings, something we usually do annually, to a small... So, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, I'm really sorry, but I, I don't wish to know about your annual management meeting, if that's OK. I mean, this is a little bit like dilation, I think, in terms of the, the answer to the question. Clive, are you satisfied with the answers you've received? There are a couple more questions. Please. So if you want to move on, um, uh, but I'm happy to move on to my next question. Please do. So, so this is about um, you know, the, the fact that you dominate the the, the, uh, the catalogues. Do you, do, you, do uh, and this is again a question to all three of you. So please, one of you step forward. Do you, do your licensing agreements with or equity equity stakes in streaming services involve any deals regarding playlisting? or algorithmic curation for your catalogues? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, okay. And you go first, Jace. Okay, um, we try our best for all of our artists to make sure that um, whether it's catalog artists or current artists are streamed as much as possible. So if I look, for example, at George Michael, three years ago, as a cat, obviously as a catalog artist, he's, 70% of his music was sold physically, and now 85% of his repertoire is now streamed. So it's equally in our interest to make sure that we look after our catalogue artists as well as our modern artists. Would anyone else like to, to add anything to that? Well, Clive, I'd just like to say probably that uh, I think your question was also pointing at whether our deals in, uh, gave any advantage to different kinds of artists and whether we got preferential terms in, in terms of things like placement. 
And the yeah. answer is no, we don't. Those are the conversations we have about the importance of ACT. And I think earlier today, the uh, PPL uh, gentleman, Peter, uh, referred to say something like how uh, Universal created such a brilliant story around Queen. Um, and it's about storytelling for us. And that is actually the nature of our business in a large way. It's about um, thriving, uh, taking artists and their creativity and telling stories about it. We don't build it into deals. All right. But, uh, I, mean, I mean, you do have a very dominant position in the market, don't you? Do you really consider it's healthy for a market that is already close to being an oligopoly to own equity in, in Spotify or major streaming services, uh, which is a major streaming service for your products? or for Tencent, another Spotify equity holder, to own shares or have shares owned by your parent companies. I mean, it, it, it is an unhealthy relationship in the, for the industry, is it not? Well, to be very clear, we don't own any shares in Spotify at this point, although you're right to talk, talk about uh, Tencent's stake in us and also <laughs> we have a small stake in Deezer, which is a significant platform in other countries. Um, but I don't think that, that that's um, more about our efforts to uh, encourage the pool to grow by licensing as many different parties as we can. Now, on occasion, when we're, when we're licensing startups and interested platforms, we will take a, a, a small stake to cover the risk that we're taking on behalf of ourselves and our artists, remembering all, at all times we're aligned with our artists' interests. So what we're attempting to do is grow as many platforms as possible, as widely as possible. <clears throat> occasion that is a solution i don't think there is any implication at all of of market power and i think when you talk about market power you should always consider barriers to entry and i think again peter earlier and, and both my my colleagues here have talked about the fact that there are very limited barriers to entry in music these days um diy is the most is the simplest way to consider that when mr eck at spotify talks about 40 or fifty thousand tracks <laughs> 50 million in being their catalog you can see we provide a very very small amount of that music thank you i'm happy uh, yeah uh, do you want to uh as well jason and then david very briefly okay so two 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 points there the first point in respect of competition and mr joseph mentioned this earlier on there was more competition in the music industry now than in 30 years of doing this job. The independent sector is a brilliant sector and signs some of the best acts. There's more, more opportunity for artists to either sign to a major label, sign to an independent label, or distribute their own records. There are more avenues today than ever that I've ever seen in my time of doing this job. So that's just the point to number one. The second point in, regard, in relation to Spotify Yes, Sony does still have a small holding in, in Spotify. When you know, Spotify launched over 15, 16 years ago, and when we do deals, we often take a small share of a company. None of us in 2006 had any idea that Spotify would be as big as it is today. None of us. I remember sitting in a boardroom and we were discussing the whole concept of streaming, and a majority of that boardroom, in fact, 99%, the one person, the, dish, the head of digital, said in that, in that boardroom, the streaming was the future. And all of us as executives at that time just didn't believe it would happen. We all totally believed in ownership, never believed that people would not want to open a CD, look at the booklet, read the track listing, read the, the liner notes. We didn't believe it was going to happen. It has, and that is great for the industry, and it is great for artists. And going back to the point on, uh, on our shareholding, yes, we, have, we still have a, hold, a, sh a shareholding. We divested um, half of our shareholding a couple of years ago, and we put, we, we put 200, over $250 million of that shareholding directly into the pockets of our artists. Thank you. David, you wanted to come in. David Joseph. Um, thank you, and not to take up too much time, I just wanted to echo the um, comments. Um, in, in my 30 years plus of working in the industry, I have never seen a more competitive environment between labels, do-it-yourself, options, de deal terms, honestly, and, and platforms. It is the most 
competitive environment with so many choices. That's all I wanted to add, Jeff. Right, thank you. Um, Jason, just to follow up on that, uh, you just mentioned there about the fact that you were in this room and no one actually believed Spotify would be as big as it was or music stream would be as big as it was. Do you recognise that the economics of the industry has not caught up with that yet? I think that 80% that, that of our revenue comes from streaming. And we spend more money on A&R and marketing, again, than I have ever seen in my, in my career. So if I look at the last few years since I've been running Sony Music, we spent over 190 million in A&R. I, I have increased the label structure. When I started at Sony Music, there were six labels within the company. Now there's 15. So it's been a huge investment in more labels in order to help us sign more acts. Over that same period, I spent over 175 million pounds on marketing those acts. We have 400, over 400 employees within our company that help you know, sign artists, market acts, do the press, promotion, digital campaigns. We have an, a huge investment. So, and I go back to the point that if, if an artist does not want to sign to Sony, they have a choice. And if they wish to earn more of that revenue, they can sign and sign to a distribution company. If you look at today, three of the most culturally important acts in Georgia Smith or AJ Tracy or Skepta have chosen to sign to a distribution company. They want a bigger share of the, 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 the revenue and that's their choice. And you know, respect to them and their management, that's their decision. I clearly would prefer them to sign to Sony Music, but that's the opportunity of choice. Um. In terms of the contracts, though, you just talked there about exactly how you've been able to diversify your own business and be able to sign more acts as a result and bring on more talent. But in terms of contracts, are they actually caught up with the world of music stream? Because obviously, one of the things been mentioned to us has been about breakages and the fact that yeah, artists have had that in their contracts. Uh, that seems to be bizarre and quite usury, actually, in, a, in, a, in the digital age. OK, so the latter point, in breakages is categorically not true. I've heard the session where it was alleged that mm -hmm. we charge breakages on, on, on physical distribution and digital distribution. From Sony Music's perspective, that is not true. That does not happen. So to the other um, two witnesses as well, sorry, just to check that, Tony and David, do you charge uh, breakages I, 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 on your artists? I, I, uh, in terms of digital royalties, they are 100% clean. They, 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 I, I did hear that in the inquiry and it, it's no, it's not an industry that I recognise or a company okay. practice that I would Th have Thank you, David. Tony, yes or no? I 100% agree with uh, Jason and David. I would point out, Mr Chair, so, that there is a different uh, definition of breakage in digital. So breakage in the old physical world related to shipping shellac records that might break. Breakage in the digital world is the uh, is where a minimum guarantee isn't reached by the number of streams we work, we get, deliver, and that works in the artist's favour. So there's a different definition of breakage in the digital world, and we need to be clear that we're talking about the same thing. But in terms of the old breakage, no, we don't. We're not involved in that at all. David, you just put your hand up again. David, David Joseph. Just to um, just to echo those thoughts because I think it's 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 really important on the on the term breakage. So. The DSP sometimes, there's a thing called digital breakage, uh, Mr. Chair. The DSP sometimes guarantee labels a minimum amount of revenue for plays of their catalogue over a certain period, which is effectively minimum guarantees. If the actual revenues paid to the label fall short of the minimum guarantees, then the DSP pays the label the balance, which is called digital breakage. Universal. So, so it's almost like a royalty. It's a royalty. No, no, it, it's just the difference between the two. But it's very important to say that Universal accounts a share of all of this breakage to artists according to the number of plays of their tracks across the minimum guarantee period in the same way as other revenue received from the platforms. I just wanted to. So, so, so we share. So, do you, do you take this money up front? Or do you take it? Do you, do you do you claw it back if you find that there's a shortfall? 
Oh, oh, oh it, it, it can it can absolutely vary because because but we share all. So in some the, cases, you do take it up front. Sometimes we take things up front, and sometimes okay. negotiate. So therefore, that is effectively it's it, you are you are putting something called breakage, which basically means that there's a shortfall in the the the, the money that you get in for the stream when actually what you, you you think you should be getting in, and that basically is set out in the contract, and that is so. Almost in some respects, it's not quite a breakage, but it's a type of 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 of, of royalty, if you like, a sort of type of royalty clawback, if necessary. If necessary, I'm not sure. It, I understand. In that way, I, I, I was sorry, sorry, uh, Tony. Well, I'll give you an example. If you write a book, for instance, for instance, I mean, I know this in terms of books. So you write a book, and it doesn't sell. I've, I've done a few of those, I can tell you. And um, what happens is you're paid a royalty, and if you don't earn out that royalty, then you have to pay that money back. That's that's in, so no. in the same way. No, no, I don't think so. so. No, I think no. what we're saying is it, we do a guarantee. Uh, we negotiate each of these deals separately, as Mr. Joseph has said. If we were, if in a deal with a platform, they guaranteed us, they would guarantee us a minimum guarantee of ten pounds. If the number of streams we our artists actually delivered added up to seven pounds, they would still owe us the three pounds. Mr. Joseph is saying that that three pounds and Warner Music was pleased to be the first company that, that instigated this procedure. That three pounds is then allocated back to the artists on the basis of their performance on the platform. So when we talk about digital breakage, it works in the favor of the artists. When we talk about physical breakage, that's a deduction. And we should be very clear what we're talking about in this language. None of us charge physical breakage anymore based on what my part, counterparts have said. And I know what Warner is. But, but all of us uh, are beneficiaries at certain times of, of having done a smarter deal than the platform realised. OK, thank you. Alex Davis-Jones. So, so thank chair, you, Chair. Would you like me to answer, chair, would you like me to answer the, the contract question or move oh, on? It's all, we'll move on. Alex Davis-Jones. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Jason, actually, I will come to you next. Um, you were just discussing a breakdown of things that the A&R has spent on, but could you give us um, a purport, exactly what proportion of that total is comprised of advances, royalties, and ancillary costs each year? So, um, it, so from an A&R perspective, I would invest um, over, again, the share of information with my competitors, but we, we was, should spend over £20 million a year and a similar amount on marketing. Um, so there's a you know, huge amount of money that goes back into investing in, in an artist because you have to appreciate that, that from a marketing perspective, it's marketing costs, it's digital costs, promo, press, radio, TV, uh, the support and we give our artists for tour support. Um, you know, obviously advances, recording costs. So that's really the collective that comes out of the, okay. the 80%. Thank you. And then those production costs that are expected to be covered by the artists themselves or the artists advance, they're then recouped by you by the royalties. Is that correct? So, so from, a, so what we give an, so when we sign an artist, we will negotiate their advances and that's done with their lawyers and their, and their managers. And then we will mutually agree what the recording cost should be. We'll mutually agree what the video cost will be. Um, and then we will, so, so those costs are recoupable. Right. The marketing costs are costs that we spend. So that's the money we invest. So if I look at, you know, I've just, I looked the other day that one of my rap artists, we gave a, a, an advance of 300,000 pounds, a recording cost of over 400,000 pounds, and we've subsequently spent over a million pounds on that artist, on marking that artist to be successful. Right. Unfortunately, okay. that artist is successful. Right. So how many artists then do you provide these types of advances to each year? Oh, crikey. Well, we, you know, as I touched on earlier on, that, that, that we've invested over £175 million in, uh, 190, pounds, 190 million pounds, sorry, in artists over the last few years. So we're signing on average probably about 50 artists a year. Okay. And if I look at how many, and also just to put that into perspective, that it is very rare that I will, that I see an album artist deal advance for less than 200,000 pounds. Okay. And, and actually quite frankly, in the modern world, with the success of, of, of platforms such as TikTok, we can see one-off singles 
that might start, you know, I might get a call from one of my labels in the morning, it's 50,000 pounds for an advance. And by the end of the day, it's 300,000 pounds advance. The singles market is a really, really huge market for one-off singles at this moment okay. in time. So you've got two different markets, really, really uh, singles driven, and then album artist campaigns, which take, I guess, considerably longer these days to, to, to market and act, and therefore the cost increase. Okay. So given that these advances are then recouped from the royalties, do you then deduct these totals from the A&R costs each year? No, no, we don't. Right. I mean, okay. it's, it's, yeah. Okay, so... No, I mean, how, we, uh, okay. my job, just, sorry if I can just, my yeah, yeah. job is to make sure that our artists are the most successful artists in the world. That's what I, when I wake up in the morning, that's what I live and breathe. And that's what we try to do. We try to give our artists every form of support and backing we possibly can. And so the, it, the, it's in our interest sometimes to invest more money in a &R, more money in marketing. You're never going to hear a manager say, stop marketing. They okay. want you to market their acts. So there's okay. a, a continual investment so, there. Okay, so that's, that's a no then. Um, so how much of your yearly income then is comprised of recoupments against historic advances? I'm sorry, would you mind asking that question again? Yeah, so how much of your yearly income is comprised of how much you make against these historic advances? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I might have to come back to you and, and write to you. I don't, I don't even know how to answer your question, I apologise. Okay, that's fine. We, we'd appreciate it if you could write back to us with that information. Sure. Um, okay. I'd now like to move on to the um, PPL fund, if, if I may. Um, it's something we heard a lot about in the last session. Um, and we know what a success this fund has been in supporting up and coming talent, you know, years and years, Sam Fender, Kit Tempest, and many, many more benefited from this fund. And it was confirmed to us in an answer to my colleague, Kevin Brennan, that um, the record labels do not contribute to this fund. Is that something that you acknowledge? This is still to me, sorry. Yeah, yeah Jason, I'll come to okay, you. I'd like to ask sorry. all of you yes or no, if possible. Okay, fine. So um, if you look, look the, the last year has been horrific and, and horrific for, for artists, especially artists that live on live. And again, Sony Music has had two funds, a, a global uh, fund, so global social justice fund. Um, and we, we've put a, an awful lot of money into helping uh, musicians, stagehands, um, music venue trust. Sony were actually a supporter of the Sony Music Trust before the pandemic. So we've invested hundreds of thousands of pounds over the past year trying to support artists during this horrible time. But, but you haven't contributed to the PPL fund? Um, I don't believe so. Right. Okay. T Tony, can I ask you yes or no? Are you aware that you've contributed uh -huh. to the PPL fund as an organization? Yes. So I think the answer is no. But right. you should be clear, as Peter explained on the PPL call, that that is a black box amount left over from dispersal. So yep. our contribution is not insisting it's dispersed. So you no. should look at it that way and say, no, we don't contribute actively. What we do passively is allow that black box, instead of being distributed by rotor of streaming, as he explained, to go to this development fund, which works in the interest of the whole industry. Yeah, a fund which is meant to support musicians and artists and songwriters is something that you benefit, have, your organisations have benefited from and is a fund that you do not contribute to. I think that's well, what we do, we're hearing. Um, the point I'm making, which is we do contribute in the sense that we don't ex insist on the black box coming back to us and being dispersed in the way that we've talked about dispersing everything else. We don't actively contribute to that fund. I think that's what Peter was saying, because as Jason says, we all have our own individual artist development funds, social justice funds and other causes. So the answer technically to your question is no, but actually it's letting go of the of the demand for that balance. Okay, okay. Um, so as we've heard, then, you know, we'll talk a bit more about, about that and, and supporting artists. Um, David, I'll bring you in. You can answer this one if you want to. Uh, the BPI have reported that last year's record label's trade income was £1.1 billion. Now, at the same time, this committee has heard from many musicians, artists, songwriters who are struggling to make ends meet. Even before the pandemic, a typical typical musician was earning just over £23,000 a year, well below the national average of over £29,000 a year. And this is according to the National Office of National Statistics. Do you think this is fair? 
May I answer the charity one first? You can come in on that, but I'd, I'd like to know your answer if, if you think that's that's No, of course, of course I'll come in and answer, but I didn't want it to appear that we weren't supporting charities. So there are lots, you know, the, 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 it's a lot of artists and musicians have been hit dramatically during the events of the year. Um, and then you add on the uncertainty of Brexit on top of the, the, the initial uncertainty. We contribute to the BPI, and I, I like the idea there's lots of different sources for, 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 for uh, charities. So we support Help Musicians, uh, MMF Rebuild, Stagehand, Music Venues Trust, Music Support, and Nordolf Robbins. I'd also like to say that we've supported a lot of our artists during this time with creatively and with payments, so that the picture of artists who are signed to us who I feel incredibly passionate about, incredibly supportive about, I care deeply about them, we've made sure of that. In terms of your question about the trade value of the industry, 2020, streaming did go up. More people, the, 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 the part of the year was that the backdrop of 2020, we all wanted and needed music perhaps more than ever before and streaming revenues grew massively this year family listening music music was necessary it's oxygen and 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 we last year alone in terms of we, we signed a hundred new artists yeah. but also a hundred artists many of whom are not household names um, more than a hundred thousand pounds last year just from streaming yeah. So we're getting recording industry out, but we are, it's important to know that whilst against this devastation of the live industry, which with everybody's help will we'll bring back, I, I, I wanted to actually thank everyone for what they're doing for the live industry, for, for Mr. Brennan particularly for raising it in PMQs, and the fact that I understand it's being raised in terms of uh, thank you very much for that. We could we could always put that at a later date. It's very kind of you. But we are on time constraints. Alex, have you had the answer to the question you were looking for? Yes, I have. I've just got one more question. Thank you. Here, if I would. We've heard a lot from, from all of you about the charitable organisations that your organisations support, um, which is, you know, very commendable. And in the last two years, more than 100 nominees of major industry awards like the Brits, the Grammys, the Ivers have all received funding from one organisation, a charity, in fact, the PRS Foundation. Now, you've all gone to great extents to talk about the charities that you support, but can you explain why, if this market isn't failing, why hundreds of our most acclaimed artists are having to seek charitable funding? Um, I don't think that that's... Uh, it's sort of um, too embracing a question. So when, when we look at the artists that are signed to us, I think Mr Joseph has explained in the case of his label, and I would second most of those, the process of supporting them, working with them. You know, we're involved with one of the biggest acts at the moment in renegotiating in a certain way to uh, allow them to support their organization through the COVID times. So this has been special challenge. But recording music is only a small portion. I mentioned today earlier that, that 40,000 tracks are going up a year, uh, a day, sorry. Um, whilst we have, uh, as uh, adding to it, David, Jason, myself, probably uh, uh, Jason, and myself, probably signed 170 or 180 artists. It's only 20% of the entire music infrastructure, and we're supporting that part of the, the infrastructure as, um, as fully as we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. No more from me. Thank you, Alex. Steve Bryan. Thanks very much, Chair, and good, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for your time. Um, I want to explore the issue of ownership which uh, one of you, I, I, think it was, I think it was Mr. Joseph, uh, referred to. Um, so when I was a young lad and I went to buy the latest Poison record at HMV in Guildford, I took it home with me. I can feel the chair reeling. I took it home with me and, and it was mine. And I could listen to Every Rose Has Its Thorn as many times as I liked. I loved the breath a bit at the start. But if I stop paying my subscription to Spotify, I can't listen to that anymore. To the, the modern Steve with his modern poison. So 
can we get to the bottom of this? Is streaming a sale or is it a rental or is it something else? Is there another term that you use? Start with you, please, Jason. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting debate, actually, as to... What's your view? My, my view is that we, the, the modern world, is living in subscription, which gives artists more of an opportunity, more artists a bigger opportunity than ever before to have their music heard. And we as record companies pay those artists on the basis of their royalty rates from their subscription. Right. Is it a sale or is it a rental, in your opinion? I go back to, the, I have to just answer the same, sorry, it's the same answer. We're in a subscription model. Today, it's a, it's a, it's a, it becomes a, a, a kind of an almost a legal conversation in the sense of what the definition is. And we're in a subscription model where, where people have the ability to subscribe and more artists have a bigger opportunity than ever before to have their music heard and we pay them a royalty based on that. Mm. Do, you, do you then pay your artists after each stream as if it were a sale? In the same way as if I bought that Poison record again, I'd pay for it again. I think, and I'm not sure, and forgive me if I'm interpreting your question wrong, the, the conversation about whether there's a user-centric model, whether an artist should, so if you listen to that album and the artist should get paid on that album compared to the current model, which means that artists are paid on the total amount of streams, that's defined as a user-centric model. Now that's a, diff, again, that's a very difficult conversation because I have, I, I look after artists across many different genres and I have many artists favour the current model and, and getting paid on the streams, on per, getting paid, sorry, getting paid per stream and the, the it, I'd be favouring one subset of artists over another. So that's a difficult part, position in this debate because I, you know, I can listen to Harry Styles 10 times or The Clash 10 times, and uh, that's my choice. But ultimately, the difficulty is I have different artists that favour the two different options. So the, so the interesting thing is, is then if, if I listen to a piece of music, if I, if I don't choose to listen to a piece of music on Spotify, it chooses something for me. And we've discussed this in other sessions on this inquiry around the algorithm. So Saturday, you know, Sunday morning jazz, Sunday morning smooth jazz. Who doesn't like that? Um, it's still then deemed as a sale. Um, yeah, yeah, please sorry. come in. Steve, I'll, I'll pick it up. What do you think the, what do you I, think the answer I, to... What do you think the answer to this is? Uh, is, it a, is it a sale is it, or is it a rental? Can I? Um, I let, let's just, just take Tony first, because he, he put his hand up. OK. Um, Steve, I think it's clear, clear uh, in the conversation that, that the streams are um, covered by the making available, right, which is the sort of internet equivalent of a sale. Why do they get covered by that area? They're covered because streams are generated by deliberate choices. You can listen to what, you can play what you want, when you want it, and skip when you don't want. And that's the, the basis of the argument that streams are equivalent to sales. You have choice. You can either choose a song directly or you could make your own playlist. Or as you say, you could listen to something like Sunday morning jazz. But when I'm listening to it, as, as you're listening to it, it will then feed me artists based on the choices I've made before. I can decide how long I want to listen to. That's not like broadcast. Uh, I can decide when, uh, when I want to listen to that. I can skip. And in some cases, platform, most platforms, subscription platforms nowadays, will offer you the chance to case your recordings or bring them down to use offline. So in all those ways, it is like a sale. And as I say, it's covered by that making available right, which is kind of what the internet has set out as the basis of equivalent to sale. Um, you see, the way that it's like a sale, so all, all the old contracts, where, you know, so when, when I was buying my, my tragic purchases, all, all the contracts would talk about sales, wouldn't they? So they're then paid as sales but you're not paid the same as sales if it's streamed, are you? Well, we've moved from a transaction, it's certainly true we've moved from a transaction-based model to a consumption-based model. So you continue to get paid over repeat as usage of your 
your uh, intellectual property as opposed to the one payment when you, and I have to be honest with you, Steve, it was perhaps me that sold it to you in Guildford R price because uh, I was working in that area. Oh, I knew it. I knew you looked familiar. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you got, I got one payment, you, you walked away with the album. Now, Brett Michaels and Poison are getting paid over and over again as, as, as you go back and explore your youth uh, in the way that I do with... with oh, my... but, the tr- the, but the thing is, you see, with Brett, um, he's already made a fortune. He's not... A, he's not a, sorry, the division belt is going here. He is not attempting to start out his career and get remunerated for his artistry. He's already been paid through the old model. So I still go back to the question, is that is it a sale or is it a rental? Can, can I, if I may... Please do come in, Mr. Brian, I'm, I'm also looking forward to sending you a copy of Songs in the Key of Life to compensate for your poison. Um, I have heard that too, yes. It's very, it's, it's, it's essential. Like oxygen. I've heard of that new artist, but, um, yes. <laughs> um, when, to, to go back to... Um, CDs with any artist or or vinyl, you the the you got paid once, and whether or not you listen to that album once, or you listen to that every day of your life, there was only one point in which the royalty was paid, and also those stores naturally they close at five o'clock. Streaming is twenty four seven in every country in the world that you can listen to the greatest record store ever. It's clearly a sale. It's not radio, it's on demand. You can go wherever you want. When I have this issue, which is actually, and and, and not, not, this isn't aimed to you. It's, 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 It's really important that it's not radio because that, it kind of underestimates the creative curiosity of the fan. Cause, cause not everyone is, on these streaming services sitting back and saying, great, I've got Spotify or Apple, I'm listening to a playlist. I mean, I'm very happy to talk about algorithms and my view very about anti-algorithms and the music that we put up. Hopefully you can bring up that with the, the streaming services because it's not something I, I, I would like different. We will, we will, we will. It is, thank, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share thoughts of how I think our UK artists could benefit from different types of models for them in terms of curation and albums rather than just lists. Um, but streaming is by demand on, on, on it, it, it's, it's on demand by nature and it gives the music fan control. So if they're listening through self selection, which is about 86% of all the uh, listening on the services or, or playlists and even on playlists on the, on the ones left, the listener fan can can choose what genre, what theme, they can skip forward, they can go back, they can listen again. So it's very, very different from, from broadcast. The, the, so there are micro payments all throughout the world. And, and, and once again, very briefly, our artists see this on their portals, on their royalty statements. So rather than the one transaction, and when it was CDs, probably the last thing I'll say is, when there were CDs, the record stores, like the one that Mr. Harlow used to work in, a bit like book publishers, they used to charge record companies for getting their records in the front of the windows and on the on the shelves, a bit like book publishers do, Chair, when you reference that. Um, now, and, and those days, about if you're in the top 10 artists, you're about 13% of artists were in the top 10. There, was, there wasn't any real uh, massive economy to it. You, are, you couldn't really do it yourself. And, and now it's absolutely the opposite. So, so it's very important to say that the real estate, the number of artists, you know, if you were... Yeah, I, I, I get it, I get it, I get it. I just, I just, just, want, to, just want to close here because it's, it's gone half 11 okay. and, uh, and there okay. is obviously okay. a, lot of, a lot of business to cover. I just, I just want to... So look, what, what, we're, what we're learning here in, in, in this session and, and other sessions is that, you know, we are talking about a new-ish world. Um, we, we often hear about, you know, the beauty of getting your music played on these platforms and getting your music heard, which is what every artist wants. Yeah, sure, every, every artist wants people to be able to, to know their lyrics and, 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 and sing along to Hey Jude. Um, but, but here's the thing, is that that's great, but you still got to get paid for it. And, uh, and you still get paid, as does uh, Jason, as does everybody that, we, that sits around this table here today. 
But let me just read you this quote from Nadine Shah. So this is in this is in Hans Sardis on the record. She gave evidence to our inquiry on the 24th of November. Um, I'm sure you know, know Nadine, who's an up-and-coming artist. She said this. All I do know is that the earnings from my streaming are not significant enough to keep the wolf from the door. As an artist with a substantial profile, a substantial fan base, critically acclaimed, I don't make enough, and she is, I, I don't make enough money from streaming. I'm in a position now where I'm struggling to pay my rent and I'm embarrassed to talk about these issues publicly. I'm embarrassed to talk about them for many reasons because money to an extent is an indication of success. Here, that is not really the case because I'm a successful musician, but I'm not being paid fairly for the work that I make. As I said in the first session, often artists are encouraged not to ask these questions. That's pretty damning, isn't it? So there's an up and coming artist who's put her heart and soul into her work, but she's struggling to pay her rent. So this may be a new world. It may be a subscription service, a rental, a radio. We can call it what we like. We can dance around these issues as many times as we like and use as big words as we want. But the bottom line is, is that here's these artists who can't afford to pay their rent. Something going wrong, surely. Don't you think, David? I, 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 I two answers to that, please. I, I think Nadine Shah is a, a, a wonderful musician. She's a fantastic songwriter. And, you know, the, the, the fact that this is coming from here, um, but the, the, the amount of money that an artist gets in terms of streaming is determined by certain parts of the, the, the models based on on certain parts of popularity. I'd, I'd be very happy to talk when you speak to the streaming services about if there are different ways artists can be paid and that pie could be split up. But it is true to say that there are some artists who have been particularly badly hit by the pause in the live business because they've got a relatively small fan base, but a very passionate fan base that they play live to very often. So inevitably their economy, as it were, has been incredibly badly hit because the major source of income they had, which was playing live, has not been available to them. And unfortunately, it's not possible and it's not logical that that would be instantly replaced by the money that they make from their recordings that was never how their earnings were shaped. So there's two parts of it. Uh, any help with the live industry that we could get, our artists are clearly not wired to, to, to stay at home. And then with the platforms, perhaps, a look at how, at the moment, all of the streams are coming to us and other artists based on popularity. And there are other ways we could look at. So. Mr. Bryan, there are, there are models that if you just listen to Nadine Shah that month, there would be models the services can do just to pay that artist rather than be diluted perhaps with all the popularity in the label pools. There's lots of ways we can approach this. You know, streaming is not, it's at the start, it's not perfect yet. There's lots of ways. I mean, I've got tons of ideas how to improve streaming for the artist. It's, it's an incredible service. It's available. It's, it's all the music you want in your back pocket, but do I think it's at the end of its life and that was it? There's so much growth in this area. I want liner notes. I want all the musicians notes. I want them to be focused on the albums. I, I, I've got this service, I, 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 which, I, which I would love, which is if I signed up to Spotify, I'd love to get the choice between, did, did, should my data be tracked and delivered to me by an algorithm or should my music be served up by the artists that I love and my friends. I, I think that there, I would love to have a service where, which wasn't based on the algorithm. I think it favors particular types of music. So I want there to be the most competitive things. I think fans, I think, I think younger audiences who I'm very, very touched with, they've got issues about data and, and algorithms and perhaps we could get to a pure service like a, you know, a six music service where things are just being curated for, for people rather than data and algorithms. I would absolutely welcome that. Okay, I, I, there's an awful lot of uh, stuff that I think that we want to cover as committee. So uh, I will- uh, hey, Thank you, other, Steve. Other glam rock bands are available and I'll hand back to you, Chair. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Uh, John Nicholson. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, can I start off with, uh, with you, Mr. Joseph? A number of our witnesses, musicians, have told us privately and off the record that they're scared of you, not you specifically, but bosses, record company bosses like you, and they're too scared to speak in public. That must make you feel very ashamed. Mr. Joseph. Sorry, I was I was I, I was on mute. I I um I I don't uh, I mean I saw I saw uh, uh, the statement that the chair um, issued and, and and absolutely not from my point of view that's not the relationship we have with any of uh, of our artists. I I um well if you're the person that does the scaring, no, uh, you're not likely. Uh, you're not likely to um, to be aware of. At least I hope you're not aware of. It. But so it's my, disturbing. It's a disturbing my, thing. You should feel this. My, my my job is to amplify the voices of our artists. That's that that is my job. And well, I, why I, don't they see it like that? Why don't the artists I, see it like that? I've been I've been speaking to artists two or three times a day, every single day since March. We're closer than ever. Out and it's not just me. Our teams, we've got huge teams who wake up, they care passionately. Well, you may feel that, but that's not what so many of the artists feel. I, I, why, I, why, I, is your, why, why is there such a gulf between your understanding of the relationship and, and their feeling about what the relationship entails? I, I, we, we really do have open and honest conversations at all, at all levels. I, I really think... They're just too sensitive, are they? No, I'm no. The, the artists are all are, are all different. One, one thing I will say that they have in common is they're not wired to stay at home. I mean, and the amount of conversations we're having and creativity and how, how can we support that creativity while they're not touring. But I don't recognise that. I, I speak to artists all the time. Our labels do. We're very welcoming. If we sp we have to understand, artists are creatively empowered and in charge and they don't have to do things if they don't want to do things really well okay all right let's 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 look at that now as we've discovered a and r is the money that goes into scouting and developing artists what what are your a and r costs as a proportion of your revenue roughly in line with the 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 market of 250 million in A and R, so somewhere between twenty percent, just in A and R and and then marketing, just in terms of signing new artists and keeping artists uh, with us for long careers. Uh, and the average royalty rate would be what? How much? Um, there are all different types of deals, so there can be deals that, I, and I'll come on to average. I, I will, but it's important. I say a lot of deals at the moment with the competitive market are just distribution. Um, a lot of them can be 80-20, some can be 50-50. If you're talking about an average advanced deal, which is 90% of deals, the, the artist wants the investment in them over a long period of time, average between 20 to 25% artist royalty. Yeah, because it's the big start to get 30%, isn't it? But the average royalty rate, I understand, is 22%. Um, now, what that means in practical terms is that a record would have to make four and a half times the agreed recoupable cost for the artist to make any money at all. Isn't that the case? Um, if I may, it's not the case. So artists come to us, in terms of artists making money, artists uh, often, and, the, and their team and, and lawyers and, and, and management ask for personal advances. They ask for advances to come all the way through the contract. I have to bring up because it's so used by us the the the, the artist royalty portal, where literally like a better than a banking app, you can see exactly what your the the current account and the the money that you're getting. So so they see all of that. They our artists seem to be very happy with the investment, very happy with advances um, for them. So it is a really they're not. I mean they're re they're, re they're really not. I think you're living in cloud cuckoo land here if you really believe that. I mean, we're not experts in this field, we're, we're politicians, but we're, our job is to sit and listen to people in the industry. Uh, you, you, you have a very unhappy industry and, and people are, artists are, are not happy. I'm sure the very rich artists are happy, but, but 
no, we signed the Ambulance. We signed can, can I, I, I can't be, I, I'd like not to be accused of being out of touch. We signed a hundred new artists last year. I deal with some of the biggest artists in the world. It's, it, it's well, on that question, what, uh, how much of your in our budgets go to new or first album artists as a percentage? Sorry, I missed how many go to? Uh, to new or new artists, first album artists. Um, a significant proportion of that 20%, there is, uh, if, if I may, and it's not to appear anything, that, that it's a very competitive situation, so I can't share my exact um, uh, a and Really? We're not, we're not asking you to share. You, you, you keep returning to the sensitivity uh, point, the commercial sensitivity. What, what the chair said earlier is, is, is spot on. We're not asking to share sensitive figures. We're not asking you to tell us um, what the artists are being paid or detailed sensitive issues like that. I mean, what, what I was asking you was something that's quite easy for you to tell me out of thought without- You're, you're correct. By, by the way, just, I'm, I, I, I apologize if that seemed evasive. You're completely right. It's, it, it's, it's millions and millions of pounds in, in new art. I mean, you, signing new artists is the lifeblood of our industry. No, uh, I'm talking about as a percentage. As a percentage, how much of your a and budget goes to new or first first album artists? R roughly 40, 50%. Right, so a, 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 a fair amount. And how many artists would you reckon are in royalty rates of 30% or more? Um, how many in percent? I think the tradi the answer is one I gave before. The majority are between twenty to twenty five. Large majority. Well, all right. Um, can I move on to um, Mr. Harlow, uh, please, if I may? Um, is, is it true that in twenty nineteen, Warner's return on capital, uh, more money went to passive investors than to developing musicians? Uh, no, I don't think it is. If, if by passive investors you mean uh, things like dividends, I don't think it is. In 2020, we spent globally about 1.15 billion on um, ANR around the world, and um, our dividends were about 280 million dollars. Well, interesting. That's not what the figures appear to show, because I have, in fact, the front, uh, the figures in front of me, and the year-end 30 September figures show that uh, recorded. Income. This is um, uh, page fifty-one of the report. Um, Three thousand eight hundred forty million, but ARR costs at one thousand one hundred seventy-eight million. That gives uh, that means that uh, more is spent on dividends uh, than on ANR. It just seems a surprising priority. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't recognise what report you're looking at. We we do um, file all our reports because we're a public company. And uh, the numbers I have in front of me are, the, uh, are from our filings. Um, and uh, that is the way that that is the balance. What I would say is in uh, across our global organization consistently, and probably with the exception of around 2014, our, our investment is around 30 to 32%. Um, and the difference between the numbers quoted by Mr. Joseph and us is what is what is quote what is on the operational p l as opposed to what goes to bigger artists who we tend to write off the investments for so uh, right well we're, we're, we can probably drill down into the figures um in in, in the report but the, the bottom line is because you're paying out so much in dividends as a percentage rather than in in er and developing people a lot of that money goes abroad doesn't it so you're actually uh, taking money out of the country and out of this industry it's not supporting the UK and UK musicians. Well, uh, as I just said to you, Mr. Nicholson, I think we have a very high R&D rate relative to other businesses. It's 30 to 32%. Um, and that, that is a high R&D and it's heavily focused in the UK where we have artists as diverse as Ed Sheeran, Coldplay, Pink Floyd, Joel Corey. You know, I can go on and on naming okay. the British talent that we All support. right, sadly, we, we, don't, we don't have time to, because we're rushing to go to the, the yeah, Commons absolutely. Chamber for a, for a statement on music. Back to you, Chair. Thank you very much. Charles Watling. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, and you also have Led Zeppelin, which I'm delighted about, and I do yes, like an album. And we do. Um, get it out, and you know which track comes next. Um, okay, very quickly, I'll be brief, because I know we're short of time. Uh, 
So what proportion of artists in your repertoire, I think this is, is to uh, Jason really, what proportion of artists in your repertoire and others can come in are upstreamed from independent or subsidiary labels? And what proportion are signed from social media as opposed to being scouted directly by your company? Okay. Um, Sony Music has a, a company called The Orchard, which distributes independent artists. Um, some of those relationships, we will help work with The Orchard and support the marketing and uh, vision with, the, with, with those labels. Um, and in respect of social media, that's that from an A&R perspective, that's one of the avenues where our A&R teams try and find and sign artists. So it's a, you know, the modern world is, you know, years back you were limited to trying to have a record on, on, on radio or TV and now there were so many different platforms to, to find artists. There's so many different platforms. Social media was so huge. Do you have an idea of the proportion, though, between social, me social media... Uh, uh, yeah, so we signed. Social media. Yeah. The acts that we've signed from social, it'd be quite yeah. high because you're, you're, you know, look at the likes of t TikTok for, at, at this moment in time. TikTok is enormous. And if I look at my top 10, my top 20 records of the past year, especially artists signed from America, a, a big amount have come from TikTok. And so, I go back to the position. Sorry, Mr. Riley, how, how is that, yeah. that picture now changing? What direction of travel is there? Are you, are you relying less on scouting directly or are you? Uh, signing directly from uh, the uh, social media platforms. Well, as I mentioned earlier, on, we still have an enormous investment in our in our A and R executives and in the in, in the different labels. I meant, made the point earlier that we'd increased our labels from six to fifteen. So that so, so we. If I was to I mean, can I reverse question? If I was to close, if my boss said to me tomorrow, go from four hundred to forty people. 35 people, 35 of those people will be a and R. We would keep those people because they are the source that find our artists. And the artists are the most important part of my life. Without the artists, there isn't any marketing, there isn't any press, there isn't any promo, there isn't anything else. You know, I have monthly meetings with new starters and I say, You're, can, you could be the best marketing person in 10 years, you could be the next CEO in 15 years, but none of you, are more important than the artists. And, so you're, and it's the a and R execs that find those artists. And they find them from a multitude of platforms, and incredibly more so from social media. So, so th thank you, and I, and I would imagine the others are the same. David Joseph, you... I, I'd know. like to add, I mean, it's a, it's a really excellent question. I mean, scouting is often online, and, and obviously, particularly during COVID, where we haven't been able to go and see concerts or everyone hang out together it's, it's been really interesting building these relationships with these new artists so the the answer I, i'd say is is, is is really simple is the majority of artists that we sign i would say 98 percent already have their music somewhere between spotify already on spotify youtube yeah. soundcloud 99 percent already are on there so we can find their music and talk about it. And during this time, most of them have been signed remotely. In, in terms of social, was one of the questions about social media accounts? Yeah, social media as opposed to directly scouted. Uh, in, in, in terms of social media, that's really the artist's choice. The majority of young artists have their own social media um, uh, uh, accounts to talk directly to their fans uh but that's not something we're getting and, and, and you as an industry at all that sorry tony tony harlow you wanted to uh, I, I was just going to make a point of clarification charles if it's possible but or, or rather an observation on this so when you talk about social media platforms or when you talk about other platforms where there's velocity of act activity for artists they're all part of a massive amount of data that our a and our teams come come into discussing people talk about the industry being isn't it simpler now no it's more complicated because we still have traditional, obviously not at the moment, stand at the back of the pub and watch mm. the act. Then we have the social media. Then we have the stream velocity. We have this enormous amount of data that comes in that makes a choice. But the point my a &R team always reinforced to me is at the end of that time, Jason has that data. David has that data. 
we have that data, then we have to make an active choice. Is this a Warner Music artist? Is this someone we want to work in? Do we believe in it? Do we think that the right, the balance in that, like is the social media balanced correctly with the streams? Does this person have the talent to deliver a hit? Three hits. That's the traditional a &R process. So all of this data is flooding into us more and more and more and more opportunity. Then the traditional a &R is still there. Discovery and do we want to sign? And that's well, thanks, thanks, to, thanks to the coronavirus pandemic, that, that uh, a a method is, has changed. So you're trawling the internet much more. A, a little bit, but you know, sometimes it's a live stream or a performance on the internet. The artists have innovated, we've innovated. This has been a year of incredible innovation in all the platforms. How can we get our artists out to a world when, when as, as Mr. Joseph said, they can't go and do the one thing that they do better than anyone else, which is connect with their audience. And we've okay. all had to work. So thank, thank you for that. I'd, I'd just like to move on very quickly and I'll, I'll, I'll go to uh, Dave, David Joseph with this one. I mean, there's a difference between the U US and UK law. I understand that in the UK, uh, if an artist signs cop copyright away, they can only get it back if the label goes bust or, or, or they agree to, to sell the rights back. In the US, artists have a right to regain uh, the copyright after 35 years, I understand. Uh, how many artists in the US uh, would you know from Universal? Uh, have recaptured their copyrights after 35 years. Mr. Joseph? You are muted. You're muted, Mr. Joseph. I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm just coming off it. Um, I, I, I'd like to address the issue of ownership. I, 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 can, um, I don't know that information to hand, but I, I will provide that to, to you. Thank you. Okay, can you do that in it's writing? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're, go we're going to move on. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Brennan. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Can I just clarify something uh, factually? Um, I think it was Tony earlier on about the Momentum Fund, because my understanding of Peter Leatham's answer was that it was only the artist share of unattributed um, royalties that went into the Momentum Fund rather than the record label's uh, share. Uh, were, were you saying in your... I think it was you, Tony, earlier. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. That 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 um that actually in your case, uh, and I don't know about the other record labels, they actually allow that unattributed income to go into the momentum fund. Is that correct? I believe that's correct, Kevin. I, I, I'd rather come back to you on the specific detail, but I believe the point that Peter was making is the momentum fund is drawn from unallocated. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I think we got that, Tony. Okay. I don't think we need to to no, go over it again, Tony. Totally, but could we clarify that perhaps in writing after the meeting, just as a, a factual thing, so we get the facts Absolutely. correct on that? Appreciate that. And from the other um, uh, labels, if that's possible, please. Um, th there was there was a discussion earlier on about whether, um, with Steve Bryan's questioning, whether um, uh, a stream constitutes a sale or, or whether it's something different, and the making available right was was talked about. I mean, isn't it the truth that actually it, it, it's a hybrid that isn't really adequately covered by current copyright uh, regulation in the sense that if I put on an album on Spotify, which I frequently do, one of my great frustrations is at the end of that album, it'll carry on playing something I haven't asked it to play. And although you can say I've got a choice to switch it off, I could also switch my radio off. But at that point, it's playing out to me like a radio a playlist I haven't chosen, but it's chosen for me by an algorithm. I mean, Jason, isn't, doesn't that, isn't there, I understand why you want to talk about it making available right, because, you know, currently that works well, you know, for, for you as a record label, but isn't the truth that this is a new thing and it needs a new definition in law, Jason? Um, I, I just feel, Kevin, that, that we, that the subscription is providing, the streaming servers are providing a much bigger opportunity for more artists than ever before. And I, I accept, I do accept that, and it's a wonderful thing, and I, and I accept it's a marvellous, uh, you know, technological achievement. But at the end of the day, it, it, it you know, when we talk, of, if I if I turn the radio on, then it's going to, it's going to, there's going to be equitable remuneration paid to uh, artists involved in those recordings. If I turn on um, what effectively is Spotify radio, it's even called Spotify radio, there isn't. Uh, and and the truth is, it's something different, isn't it? But you still have the opportunity, as you as you highlighted yourself, that you can you can choose to listen to that track. You can skip that track. You can listen well, to them. And, and I could on. I could skip to another radio station as well, couldn't I? 
but it, it, it's 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 absolutely not anyway. I don't want to I don't want to pursue that too far, but I just want to um, to to make that point. And if if you wanted to make further points about that in writing to the committee, then I I, I think that that would be um, potentially useful. What I did want to do is is talk about um, the, some things that were talked about in earlier sessions about the nature of of, of record deals and how they work these days. And and uh, David, David Joseph mentioned earlier on about the sort of percentage royalty people might get in a in a standard type of of record deal. Um, in in the world in the economics of streaming, um, if a, if an artist signs, and I, I'm, I've given an example, you know, I listened to what David said and some others said earlier on about the sorts of figures that might be involved. If, if someone signed a, a sort of standard record deal with an advance of say three hundred thousand pounds, and um, there were additional costs on top of that of, of let's say two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, it doesn't sound unreasonable from what David was talking about earlier on and some of the others. And they got, let's say, a fairly generous 24% deal. You said it was somewhere between 20 and 25 normally for new artists these days, David. Um, how many streams would the artists have to achieve in order to earn one pound in net profit, would you estimate? Um, David, do you want to have a go at that? Um, I'm not a, um, a, a, a mathematician, so I, I'm very happy to do... Uh, Two, two things, which is one, because uh, I can't actually, uh, I've got very good people around me who can add up like that. I will provide you that information. Okay. Before you do, David, I just want to please. press this point a little bit, if you'd excuse me. Um, Jason, w w would you have a, a, an estimate? That was a £300,000 advance and about £250,000 of other, uh, other costs. Okay, so if you were to look at, at um, an artist having... Um, 50 million, sorry, say 10 million streams, that's roughly 50 million pounds, 50,000 pounds worth of revenue. And then taking the royalty of 20% for the sake of easiest maths, um, that would be 2,000 pounds. I, right. I, I like, I would have to get a calculator out as well. But if you look at that as a rough. Okay. Estimate, and, and, and Tony, what, what would you say to that? Um... Well, similar with the mental math logistics. Uh, um logistics but we would probably say that a million streams is is worth it of four to five thousand pounds in revenue and uh that would deliver on that same 20 percent uh metric uh a thousand pounds to the artist we so have I, 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 yeah go ahead sorry tony to add kevin um the, the the number of artists reaching those levels is changing quite considerably so in 2016 582 Warner UK artists did a million streams, eight did a billion. In 2020, 1,739 Warner artists do a million, uh, 35 do a billion plus. Those billion plus candidates would all be recouping that deal, I would think. Four of our acts did 10 billion streams plus. Okay. Those artists so, are earning multiple millions. So there's a there's a very handy little, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at maths, actually. I did get a, a grade A in my O level, which is equivalent to a PhD, I understand these days, <laughs> according to Michael Gove et al. And um, uh, the, but there is a handy app online, uh, which I don't know if you've ever seen it, called Deal Sim Creatos, which is, as you said, there's lots of handy things for artists these days so that they're not, you know, signing into deals in, in complete ignorance or, or under any, any, any pressure that they might have been in, in days gone by. And if you put in that deal into, into that app with 300,000 uh, it's in dollars on this because it's an American, but $300,000 artist advance and, and 250,000 pounds in the other costs, recording costs, et cetera, and other marketing costs that might be recoupable. It, it says that for the artist to uh, earn $1, and if you put in pounds, one pound, um, they would have to achieve 458.3 million streams um, to, to, to earn one pound in net profit. Uh, out of the deal. Um, now, uh, obviously, I, I'm asking you to comment on, a, on an app you haven't, haven't looked at or had your experts go over, but does that sound totally wrong or is that about right, Jason? It, it's not, it's definitely not a figure that I'm aware of, Kevin. But Kevin, can I just talk about your uh, uh, deal model? It's important, your deal model that you're discussing, the artist has the choice to take the £300,000 and have the £250,000 and they have the equal choice to go to a, street, to a distribution platform and take... But if they, want to, if they want to sign with a major label, 
this is the kind of deal they've got to do. And the £300,000 advance, although it sounds like a lot of money, it might be shared amongst a group of artists. And you are buying, are you not, for that? And they, they've got to repay it. It's got to be recouped. And you are buying for that, are you yeah. not? Yeah. The life, if I can finish, Tony, if they are buying it, are you not? The life of the copyright, which, which yeah. lasts how long, yeah. Jason? Okay. To, to that point, and this is one of the points that I saw in one of the earlier sessions, the idea that three major record companies are putting down on the table three exact similar deals of a take it or leave it for an artist feels like something for over 50 years ago. That is not true. The modern deals are all different. I do license, again, it's competitive information, but I do license deals, I do distribution deals, I do life of copyright deals. There's different things that are important to different artists. One, one artist might want a, a huge, large advance and be prepared to do, give the life of copyright. Another one will choose to say it take lesser, more royalties and prefer to do a, a license. Every deal is different. And, and the idea that it's literally sign here, take it or leave it, isn't the case, Kevin. So um, so when when artists tell us that, that basically the, the standard record deal is 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 pretty much what you'll be expected if you sign with a major record label to uh, go into. You're saying uh, no. There's all sorts of other options on the on the table that are, um, uh, are are as easily available to them. They have an absolute choice. And is that the same across all the three major record labels? Jason, you've made your point. Tony. Yes, absolutely. I think we offer everything from DIY. We have a DIY platform through distribution deals. Uh, there are all sorts of different deals within the traditional deal because there are label deals, joint ventures, development deals. There's such a wide choice. So that was the first point I was just going to pick you up on, Kevin. The other one is the idea that re advances are repayable. They are not repayable. They're investments. And we, we give them to artists based on this knowledgeable, uh, informed basis that an artist can make a choice on. Whether it's But they are recoupable, Tony, aren't they? They are recoupable, but they're not repayable. They don't bear, bear any interest. And if they fail to recoup, then we take the, the, the cost of that and the risk of that. And uh, David, so, so and the impact of that, David, is it is it not? I mean, going back to my example of 458.3 million streams being necessary to make a net profit of one pound uh, from streaming, because we are in, looking at the economics of streaming here in this inquiry. The same um, app tells me that the, the total label profit, if 400, and this includes you know, obviously the advance, et cetera, et cetera. It is a net profit. The total label net profit, if 458.3 million, uh, million streams is achieved, is not one pound, but 1.19 million pounds. Does that sound about right to you, David? Um, no, and I, uh, I'm sure you'll understand it's difficult for me to con... Uh, no, the numbers, no. For, for us, it's about a million streams, is about 5,000. <laughs> Pounds uh, in terms of uh, those those streams. That's the artist royalty. But obviously, I can't comment on something I haven't seen. I would like to say something, um, Mr. Brennan, which is, uh, and I want to speak on behalf of our our teams. Oh. We are the principal supporters and finders of our artists at the first point of, of, of their career. And I would like to say, of these sums of recoupment. That goes on to tour support, that goes on touring, et cetera. So I don't recognize the figure you said, but if you were an artist on the deal you've talked about, 300,000 pound advance, 250 on A&R, I'd pretty much tell you they'll probably get a publishing deal of around- Okay, I, I, I accept, I accept that, David, that there are, there are other- it's so there are other things involved, and we'll we'll explore publishing and and well, so on please, separately. I know. I hope so, but please, I know that. please understand. We're taking. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt, because this is so important to me, my, our artists and the people that I work with. I cannot tell you how important it is that we understand this. We I understand that, but all I'm trying to do is of the risk, and they'll get money from merchandise. They'll get money from publishing. They'll um, get money from live. They get money from broadcast income, and they deserve it all. But I say, and you've made, and you've made order, that point. Order, order, okay, Kevin. Thank you, Chair. And you've made that point, David. And and you know, there's 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 plenty of opportunities to make that point. I'm just trying to simply, you know, understand how they how that deal would work. And my point is this: is that according to 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 this 
a tool which is put together to help artists to take the decisions, which, which we're talking about, it's, it, it says that in that instance, um, of that kind of deal, they'd have to have 458.3 million streams to make one pound in profit. That the record label's net profit on that would be 1.191 million 674 pounds. Now, you, you, I, you know, I'm not expecting you to be able to, to, to actually confirm that now, but you can look at it later and say and challenge it. And by all means, we as a committee will will accept that evidence. But isn't if that were true, wouldn't that be the economics of music streaming? in a nutshell, that by the time the artist earns one pound in net profit from the deal, the record label earns over a million pounds in net profit. Or is that totally unfair? Tony, you look like you're wanting to respond. Kevin, it's difficult to comment on the specific numbers. I'm not sure when they talk about the label in that situation, whether they're allowing for what we provide for that and the huge infrastructure that involves in being in 70 countries, which we all are. But the real specific point is, the advance is an upfront payment. It's an interest-free investment in that artist, and they've had that money already. So when you talk about the one pound, they've already taken out. They are actually cut. The recoupment is, is retain, returning the upfront investment in the artist. So but just remind us, Tony, how what you're getting for that advance is the is the life term of the copyright, isn't it? How long does that last? The lifetime of, of copyright will yeah. depend on which market you're in. If if you are given an advance in the UK to a, an artist, yeah, I, I think three hundred thousand pounds. How how long is the the copyright you're buying out with that advance? How long does that last? Fifty years. Yeah. So you're you're so that's you know the artist from their point of view, they're giving you something that Kevin, you that, 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 that that will last over fifty years. That's simply the point David, I'm making. It isn't just David, a, a one-off payment to blow down the pub, is it? David has take, has made the point that we that we are mutual investors together in a in a career, which often is starting from almost nothing. And building up, uh, building up over time, we, we make an upfront payment, and that's what you're talking about when you talk about recoupment. That's not repayable, and that's interest-free, and it's by nature of an investment. We stay, we continue to hold the stake in the investment. Um, thank you, Chair, and uh, I think Jason. I think I should probably just give you a quick opportunity, but just to say what uh, you want uh, to uh, say. Very briefly, Kevin, you're also assuming that an artist wants to recoup. Many artists are not interested in recouping. All right, I haven't, got, I'm not, I haven't got time to explore that now, but I, I, I'll, I'll take the point. Okay, um, thank you. Oh, back to you, Chair. Thank you. Damien Hines? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I can ask uh, you, Tony. Um, so there's been a lot of focus on the share of streaming revenue that goes to record labels. But I want to ask about the share that goes to the streaming platform, which seems to be remarkably high. I just wonder why you allow that. Is, that, is it ingratitude? Uh, having been saved from the pirates, or is it more to do with the market dominance of a handful of leading platforms? Uh, it's a difficult question to answer because every single streaming platform and our relationship with them is subject to an individual negotiation. But there's, um, there, there's there, to be, there are a small number of very large ones, aren't there? Absolutely. And what I was, what I was going to go on to say is, it's it's a two-way negotiation. We have rights and music; they have their interests, and we get the negotiation, which is not not hidden in any way. Uh, um, and governed by the market to the best place we can for our artists. As David says, the difference as I see it is our interests are 100% aligned with our artists. We are interested in licensing our copyrights, albeit on fair terms. We'll, we'll make the odd decision around something like freemium or free music, uh, where we think we can expand the market and that pool that I talked about several times before. Platforms support music, but ultimately they are delivering for the economics of their platform. I can't really speak to whether they're getting the right amount. I've seen public comment on some of them not, not being financially, uh, not making money. They might argue themselves. I think when you when you speak to those platforms, you should ask them about the amount they take. Well, don't, don't worry, Tony, we will. And I want to come on to freemium in a moment. But just now, so for, do you recognise the figure of about 30% of total revenue going to the going to the platforms? And Given everything you have on your side, you have all the content, you have all the talent, you have all the entertainment. Does that level of remuneration for the platform not suggest something of an imbalance in power? Uh, it's the result of a market-led negotiation. Uh, and I, I don't think I can comment on whether that's what, what I think about that level. I think they have substantial and huge costs. They also run in uh, globally and they have... Um, 
many staff, but, but you, I really think you have to direct that question towards the DSPs. I, I, Mr. Hines, I would like to say we, we have fierce negotiations with the DSPs. They're ongoing all the time. I, I, I really, it's important to say that when our artists win, we win, when we win, our artists win, anything we could do to make that as big a share as possible, I think you'll find some comments from them about one may be about Safe Harbour and Article 17 and the fact that it can be free on YouTube. And one may be this, we've got lots of overheads and lots of data and lots of technology. So a, a bit like the old record store days when they have a margin, I, I'm all for the platforms to get remuneration for what they put into the market. And I'd like as many services and tech platforms as possible for the fan. But yes, so we, we argue all the time over how much of, of that should be for, for the labels and the artists. We, we are very, very short of time. I, I want to turn to Jason, please, and ask about freemium. So in, back to the old days that uh, David was talking about, I mean, you wouldn't give away your clients' work for free, apart from the occasional flexi-disc sellotaped on the front of a magazine. With freemium, aren't you effectively just financing the expansion of these platforms, why would you give away your clients' work for free like that in the interest of the platform? Well, the, it, you know, services such as Spotify are, are ad-funded, and, and, and my personal view is we would much rather that, uh, that, that the ad-funded model was not there, that actually the people literally went to subscription straight away. That's 95% of our revenue comes from the subscription model, Spotify argue very, very strongly that that ad-funded model is the, is the funnel into subscription. Well, they, well, they, well, they, well, but no, Jason, not, of course, of course really Spotify that. say that. That's how, they, that's how they grow their market share, by giving the product away for free, financed by this massively reduced royalty that goes to you and your artists, and then they can convert some of those people in time to paying customers. Of course they say that. The revenue from the from the ad funded model is incredible, it's, it's 5%. It's, the subscription model is 95%. And if their model says that as a result, and, and I understand your point. By, by revenue, I'm not, I'm not, not, by revenue not by numbers, you. right? By, by revenue, I, not by volume. I, I don't disagree. I would get, and quite frankly, if the ad funded model went tomorrow, I'd be delighted. The Spotify's business model says it works for them. And again, I think that's a conversation you should have with them. I, I sympathize with your point. I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, but that's what their business model says, is that that part helps increase subscribers. I'm with you. Let, let, me, let me turn to Tony for my final, uh, my final question. Um, so you could say that this situation works very well for most people. It works well for the, uh, the platforms uh, who are growing and growing their, their income. It works well for record labels because you get stable income from subscription services. And actually, arguably, it works very well for the consumer because you can get an awful lot of music for a affordable price. But arguably, it doesn't work so well for those consumers in the medium term if artist development and new talent hasn't shared in that success in the same way. How do you, how do you react to that? I'm assuming, sorry, Damien, to be different, but by this situation, you mean the current balance? Yeah, the, absolutely. The, the move to streaming, the move away from piracy before, but also, frankly, the move away from physical sales back, back in the day. The fact you've now got consumers paying a fixed monthly price a very predictable revenue stream uh, for the uh, for the label, and actually a relatively uh, affordable price for most people in terms of the vast amount of use they can get for it. Well, we, I, I think our answer to that would be along the lines of it's still a pretty new industry. Someone spoke about this earlier. The, the, the balance is still there. When we talk about share of digital music, in, in reality across the world, digital music is about 65 percent it's been a thing for as we've said for maybe five or six years if you consider the lifespan of the cd or vinyl 30 years the economics are working their way through and as i said in my answer to mr brennan increasingly we're seeing larger and larger numbers of artists who are getting to the million stream the billion stream the the, the multi-billion stream and we're seeing that grow all the time as the as the economics of this this um uh industry work 
better and better. They're all about how much consumption there is. And what all of these different answers, when you go back to your freemium answer, it's all about the maximum number of people encountering music, falling in love with music like David, Jason and I all did 30 odd years ago and, and enjoying music and then gradually saying music has value. That's something that we as a company, we're always fighting for the value of music. And that is how we would, how I would look at that situation. This is an evolving situation. It's being well governed by a market that's sufficient and nimble. And, and it doesn't need any change and any disruption could diminish UK competitiveness at a time when I feel the UK needs to be the home of recorded music, just as it is by providing one in 10 streams around the world, by being the number two export business. We need to be getting on with making the UK the absolute best place to invest in music. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Damien Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, David, uh, Universal didn't sell its stock uh, when Spotify went public. Um, do you understand why these cross holdings and so on give rise to the thought that the biggest players in this industry are, if not a technical oligopoly, something close to it? Who wants to answer that? Uh, David. Sorry, it was, it was for me. Um, I, I can only speak uh, so on behalf of Universal. In terms of your question on, on, on equity, um, some record labels were awarded small shares of equity in some streaming service when the services were first set up. Um, some labels, as been discussed, have already sold that equity and shared the proceeds with their artists. Universal's made it very clear to our managers and artists that if we were to sell any equity, it will also share the proceeds with its artists. And, and that's something we discussed with, with all of our managers. We've made it very clear um, on that, the equity sure. shared with the artists. Sure, that, I mean, that, 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 I think that's, that's all fair good. enough. It's good for the art. I think the fact that we managed to get it and the fact that it will be shared with the artist puts another form of income revenue straight into the artist's hands i think it's a i think it's a very positive positive thing for the market but the i mean the, the suspicion will arise that obviously it could lead to anti-competitive influences uh, when it comes to licensing or, or or playlisting and so on can you assure us that that kind of thing doesn't happen oh a, 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 absolutely um i mean it's a it's it streaming's Streaming has is, has democratised the entire industry, Mr. Green. In terms of, uh, I mentioned before that majority of the artists that we sign already have some of their musical footprint already on these services. So it's it's hugely competitive in terms of licensing. But we want obviously the best deals that we can for our artists and our investment from all of the platforms. And and if I may say it again, I think. You know, we've had 15 years of decline. If, if I've lived through that decline and what it was like to work in the music industry, we're starting to grow. All of our artists, and this is essential, are global from day one. It's a growing industry. I don't, we're great at it. We're less than 1% of the world's population and 10% of the world's music consumed. I do not think streaming services are perfect. I think there's lots we can do more for the artists and that's stuff that uh, I want to discuss. It's, it's hard against this backdrop of YouTube and 70% of the music of our artists being consumed and giving us only 5% of our revenues. So I'd love more that we can get for our artists from any service all the time. That, that, that's, that's, the point. that's the point of all the deals that we do, representing our artists in a growing UK economy and to add an export business that we should be deeply proud of. So it's a growing, in, it really is a growing industry. That, and, I, and I have to say, we've had 15 years of piracy and decline and the music is still available for free. We're losing around two, out 200 million a year through piracy. So if there's anything we can do on that side, or if that, that's something you look into, I think you'd find our artists incredibly grateful for that. I, I, I'm sure that's right. I mean, you, you, uh, Steve Bryan um, talked about the, the evidence we had from Nadine Shah, but I mean, looking at a, an artist from another generation, we've all had an email from Sandy Shaw, 
uh, saying that with British record companies being bought up, our crown jewels are gone, this is quoting her, and there's currently no such thing uh, as the UK record industry. So it's interesting to all that you say across the generations, the artists are, to put it mildly, clearly deeply suspicious uh, of, of the majors. And so what can you say to them to try and reassure them? I, I can only speak on behalf of our artists. I actually think, um, uh, um, and I'll have to check and submit it to you, but I think Sandy did a deal with us a few years ago that she was, she was, uh, she seemed happy to make. I'll, I'll have to check on that. I can only speak to the artists. We're talking about uh, um, Mr. Green, that the business has been really going down and down and down. We've been up against the ropes. We've been told so many times by tech companies, by live companies, that there'll be this platform disintermediation. Artists don't need you. We'll go directly to the platforms. We have been told we are, it's, it's like being told, what are you doing? Why do you exist? And we've bounced back because when people for 15 years in an industry that you love, that you want to support artists say, you're going out of date, you're behind, you're not listening. And we're leaning, it makes you lean into technology more. It makes you fight more. It may, I've got a team of people and I, and I, and I have to say this, there's often this depiction of Slytherin rather than a company of Gryffindors. And, and, and I have to say these people who've for, for years been told you can't do. I, I think that the performance has been more Hufflepuff today, to be honest with you, Mr. <laughs> Joseph. But look, uh, <laughs> D D Damien Green, are you, uh, uh, is, is that your final question? Yes, it was. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings a, a close to our session. Thank you, Tony Harlow, Jason Lee and David Joseph, for your evidence today. Order, order.